Wednesday, May 26, 2021. Uh, my name is Don Philibert and I'm the chair of the Development Review Board. And with me are board members. Um, Mark, are you with us? Mark, okay. Uh, myself, Alyssa Iring, um, and Dan Albrick. I think Stephanie Langan is recused from this. Um, project, isn't she, Marla? <clears throat> Stephanie Lyman is recused and Jim Langan was unable to make it tonight. Right, okay. And also in attendance from the city of South Burlington is Marla Keene, our development review planner, uh, Delilah Hall, zoning administrator, and Paul Connor. Um, new dad, Paul Connor, congratulations, Paul, um, who is the planning director for the city. So are there any additions, deletions, or changes in the order of agenda items? Hearing none, I will make, ask if there are any announcements that people need to make or want to make. Don, would you like to announce about meeting protocol? Um, <clears throat> or I can I can read it just from the top of the agenda. Protocol meeting meeting how to be recognized and all of that. Yeah. Okay, I can I can do that. First of all, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, and um, if you anyone who wishes to be considered a um, participant in the meeting should sign in on the chat box or send an email to. Um, uh, Marla at M K E E N E at S com, And this is necessary. It's necessary for you to sign in in case you want to, at some point in the future, want to have party status for an appeal of the board's decision. Uh, I also would ask that you mute your phone um, or your your audio, and I think this is a small enough group, but our preference is unless you are speaking or unless you're a board member or the applicant, it's helpful if you actually turn off your uh, video because um, it, 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 it's confusing when there's a lot of people on the on the screen. Any other announcements or clarifications about procedure? Okay. Um, we have one project to review tonight, and this is a continued, um, continued uh, preliminary plat. Here it is. Um, I will read it, but I need my reading glasses. It's a continued preliminary plat application, <clears throat> pardon me, SD 20-40 of O'Brien Eastview LLC to create a planned unit development of six existing parcels currently developed with three single family homes and a barn and totaling 102.6 acres. The development <clears throat> is to consist of 135 homes in single family duplex and three family dwellings on nine lots totaling 21.8 acres, 19 commercial development lots totaling 44 acres, one existing single family home and 25.1 acres of undeveloped open space, <clears throat> pardon me, at 500 Old Farm Road. Um, I will um, ask the applicants to introduce themselves in a minute. First, I want to ask if there are any uh, disclosures or uh, recusals other than Stephanie. And I myself will disclose that I um, own a home, a townhome in the O'Brien development, but I don't believe my participation um, is um, influenced in any way by that. And if anyone disagrees, I'm happy to listen to you. Okay, um, so we, we have um, reviewed this application on February 17th, March 26th, and April 20th, and again on May 18th. Um, so we will be picking up where we left off uh, from um, our meeting with this applicant a week ago. 
Uh, we reviewed a lot of comments and we have many more to review tonight. But before we start going through the staff comments, I think I want to turn it over to Marla to talk about the traffic study. And then we'd like to hear from Paul Connor um, about zoning issues relevant to this um, C commercial one and limited retail zone district. So Marla, tell us about the traffic study, please. Sure. So um, this project did involve a traffic study and the board, because it is a large project and involves a lot of offsite intersections, the board invoked technical review of the traffic study. Um, one of the recommendations of the traffic study, actually there were a number of recommendations of the traffic study, excuse me, which are in the packet for the board, um, starting on, I guess, page four of the packet. Um, there's a bunch of recommendations. One of those recommendations was to evaluate a single lane roundabout at Kimball, for Kimball Ave and Old Farm Road and also at the IC Road. <clears throat> the staff recommendation regarding this comment of the independent third-party technical reviewer is for the board to consider whether to direct the applicant to complete the evaluations. Um, and then any such evaluations could, should include analysis of the impacts to large vehicle capacity. Um, the board has not discussed this technical review item, um, but the applicant has taken it upon themselves to um, move forward with a roundabout study. Um, staff notes in the first page of the packet that it seems as though the board may, if they first of all need to decide if such a such an evaluation is actually needed. And second, if the board decides to recommend such an evaluation, they should set forth some parameters. Um, parameters could be things like, um, you know, must result in level of service C or better, or like must not result in impacts to adjoining properties, or, um, you know, must be <clears throat> no cost no more than the currently proposed traffic signal alternatives. Um, you know, any kind of parameters that would direct the applicant um, and, you know, provide sort of a litmus test for whether the evaluation um, was successful and that and or whether the roundabouts are a no-go um so i guess i'd like the board to discuss amongst themselves this recommendation of the third-party technical reviewer um and decide if they would like the applicant to perform an analysis or not um as ter in terms of staff position we don't really feel strongly either way. The board has some experience looking at single lane roundabouts on Kimball Ave when the FedEx project came along. Um, and I think the board was, you know, thought it wasn't the, a winner in that location, but it wasn't a clear loser either. It was sort of like, you know, it's a little better to go with a signal than a roundabout. And that's why we ended up with a signal there. Um, so what are the board's thoughts on this recommendation of the independent third party technical review? Okay, members, what are your thoughts? What page is the recommendation language in again on the traffic study? Um, we excerpted it on page three um, of the packet. Okay. On the screen, Dan. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Don, can I offer my comment? Sure, Mark, go ahead. Please. Um, I, I think that we should, you know, require the applicant to complete these. Those recommendations that you sort of brought up, Marla, seem reasonable um, in terms of, you know, you know, once we are able to evaluate it, you know, we're not going to, you know, require an undue burden. But at the same time, you know, you know, we want the best possible solution long term for the traffic circulation infrastructure um you know i personally am not a huge fan of roundabouts but i see their merit if they're done properly and done right um so i think a study is is does is merited um for this 
and you know parameters uh, you know i think we can certainly do are you looking for us to pro provide parameters at this meeting marla um yeah it doesn't have to be specific but you know okay. the sort of things that would be a pass fail for you um if they were to evaluate a roundabout and you know we would want them to start on the pass side obviously it, they would start what part of me we so if if there's a certain thing about a roundabout that would make it a deal breaker you know we would right. to evaluate a roundabout that didn't have that characteristic so sure. if a deal breaker was taking of non-involved property yep. they yep. roundabout would have to not involve other property right i i think that the the you know your like two to four whatever the, the list of your recommendations seems reasonable to me um, I think if it's comparing it to a signalized intersection and then just, you know, we'd like to see the pros and cons of signalized versus a roundabout, you know, um, you know, you're right. If it makes sure it doesn't provide a C or less of um, intersection level of service, um, you know, it doesn't cost more than the signalized, um, doesn't impact adjoining properties and, you know, we should be logical and can, you know clear in terms of the um, traffic flow for you know the, the, the everyday user. Okay, good good thoughts, Mark. Other people, I actually have a question. I I believe we're talking three intersections in this project. Is that correct? I think it's two. Um... So it's it's Kimball and Old Farm, right? And not Kennedy and two brothers. No. The recommendation was not to look at that one. It was to look at the future IC road. Um, okay. Uh -oh. Computer seems to be frozen. I was going to um, call out a page to look at. Um, page eighteen. Well. I guess you get it. 19, you is, picture. 19 is pretty good. C1 overall site plan. Lila, can you activate drawing tools, please? Drawing tool enabled. Yeah. Thanks. So, the recommendation of the traffic of the independent third party technical review is to look at it in these two locations. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Is there a what's the ballpark? How many years away before IC Road is built? Mm -hmm. Applicant, you said five to six. Is that what you said at the last meeting? I think it depends on the you know, the timing of, of projects on those lots, but I don't think it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's unreasonable to expect it, it to be in the first couple of years of the project. Well, you wanted to build the beginning of that road right away, right? Because of the construction thing. Yeah, I think, you know, we would, uh, we would be probably constructing, you know, the rough, aspects of it in terms of a construction access right out of the starting blocks um, but in terms of it actually being a usable road i think you know we it would probably be a couple of years into the project before it would be um, you know accessing anything other than construction equipment gotcha thanks yeah. so so in response to that i i could agree that you know assessing the intersection of old farm road and Kimball makes some sense um because the road exists already and there'll be traffic through there and there is traffic so but i, I just don't requiring a an evaluation of a roundabout at icy road just seems premature maybe we could condition it on upon x amount build out of ABC or something that would really trigger a need to evaluate it, but it would seem premature to look at it right now just because th the situation will change, conditions will change, life will change, and seems far too early. 
for that okay. particular intersection. What do other board? Go ahead, Marla. They are seeking approval for the configuration of the IC road with this application, though. I understand. I just know how long transportation planning things drag out, and this road's not going to be built for several years. So, what do other board members think? Can I ask you a follow up question to the Mark. applicant? And I forgot what the phasing was, and it's sort of more also a follow up to Dan's question or comment. Um, Old Farm Room is, is getting reconfigured right now. It sort of almost comes straight across and down and intersects. Kimball a lot closer to Kennedy. When is that realignment happening in terms of the project uh, schedule? Uh, so we talked about that at the last hearing a little bit. We have it tied to the phasing plan. Um, I unfortunately don't have it memorized. Uh, I don't know if Evan, do you remember specific percentage? I, I believe it was in the year two of the project, essentially, was when the construction of the road was was sort of planned to start. Um, and and so you're gonna so you're gonna cut in the IC road as a construction access road, roughed in beef and that'll be used for construction equipment and it'll sort of get roughed in before the realignment of old farm road occurs. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, with that, I, I feel that doing both of them at the same time, just from a feasibility investigation, is worth it since the IC road, at least from a curb cut access standpoint, is going to be operating well before the old farm road is reconfigured and realigned. So I think knowing what a roundabout would do at those two intersections um, is sort of an important study and information to, to have and know. Other board members weigh in. Dan, can you live with that? Sure. Okay. So we are, I just want to be clear, <clears throat> we're asking the applicant to um, do an analysis comparing uh, the development of uh, signalized intersect, two signalized intersections with um, a roundabout at each of those intersections and look at the pros and cons, including costs of both of those options for those two intersections. Is that correct? Is that what we're looking for, Marla? Um, yeah, that seems to be what Mark and Dan were in favor of. I mean, given that we only have a quorum tonight, it would be helpful to hear from you and Alyssa as well. I, I'm fine with that. I think that makes sense. Yeah, no, I'm in agreement with what Mark said as well. Um, yeah, now, I mean, it's, it's cost, it's level of service, and it's impact to adjoining parcels. Right. So those are kind of the criteria. Now, yeah. when when would we be looking at this? Would we not close a preliminary plat until that analysis is done? Well, so I gave the example of the FedEx project. Um, that project did not look at a roundabout until the final plot stage of review. Um, if the impact is minimal and the cost is comparable, um, it may be reasonable to just kind of think of them as interchangeable parts. Um, but if the applicant feels strongly that they would rather have that solidified before a final plot, I'm fine with it at, the, at either preliminary or final. So why don't we ask the applicant, Evan, Andrew, <clears throat> what are your thoughts? Yeah, we, we would, um, you know, we've already done uh, most of the analysis necessary. I think we just assume um, sort of button that up and resubmit it to the board for review to get to get impact on. Um, I'm not a, an engineer, but I, I do think that the sort of, um, the sort of, uh, ancillary impacts of the roundabout sort of get into uh, grading of the site roads and the project, you know, well on the roundabout um, and a changing intersection elevations and things. And maybe Scott, could you explain that that piece of it and why that is important that we sort of get that resolution? Sure, sure I can, because because what we're, we have looked at this a little bit. I mean, we didn't have a, a ton of time, but 
we did it enough to get some some sort of large picture ideas of, of the impacts on the road. And one one thing that uh, we're concerned about is that anyone who's ever driven down um, by this project on Campbell Avenue you would recognize that you're, you're looking at a hill, it's a hillside. Mm -hmm. And at any intersection, whether it's a traditional intersection or, or a roundabout, your, your new road coming into that intersection has to come in at a relatively flat grade for a certain amount of length before you can sort of take off up the hill at a steeper slope. And so the addition of the roundabout is going to cause that to go another 30, 40 feet into the project, which is going to cause, you know, what are already some very deep cuts. Um, when I say cut, the finish, what I mean is that the finish grade of the road is going to be, you know, six to eight feet to 10 feet below the existing grade out there. So we're going to be creating basically tunnels up the slope. And, and we were doing that to some extent anyway, but by virtue of having to start, you know, further into the project, that's going to exacerbate that situation a lot. To the point, to the point where it's going to affect other intersections. I, I hear you, Scott, I hear your point on that issue, but yep. you also, you know, and I know you have to follow, you know, DOT standards and rating and stuff, but, you know, Winooski, has its you know it's an oval roundabout but it's on it it's on a hill it's on the slant yeah. and and that was, I, I would point out that that was obviously a retrofit and when you do retrofits you know certain standards are waived all the time and i i don't think public works is very interested in, in waiving a lot of those for, for right. a brand new project well and that's and that's the the criteria we're asking you if you you present it and say you know public works isn't going to accept it because it's going to have too much of a grade, that's part of the criteria we're asking you to look at. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I think my, our only point is that, you know, we'll certainly produce a more uh, robust memo in regard to this uh, that can get reviewed, but but we can sort of figure it out because I think it wouldn't just be, you know, pulling the traffic light out and popping the rotary in, right? It would be extensive regrading and re-intersection designs. It would impact, you know, numerous aspects of the project, um, you know, well beyond just being able to kind of plug and play it. So we, we do want to get it figured out. Okay, so are you <clears throat> pretty clear about what the board is asking of you, Evan, Andrew? Yeah, Roger, do you have any questions? Roger is the traffic engineer. Um, and I apologize, I did not um, ask the applicant to introduce himself. So let's just take a brief pause now. Who is here for the applicant, please? Evan Langfeld from O'Brien Brothers. Thank you. Andrew? Uh, Andrew Gill with O'Brien Brothers. All right. And I'm Scott Homestead from Krebs and Lansing Consulting Engineers. Okay, and Roger? And I'm Roger Dickinson from Lamar Own Dickinson Engineers. Thank you. I'm Don, sorry I forgot to do that. Don, you should ask if any, I, Roger, I'm not sure if you've been on any before, if anyone needs to be sworn in that hasn't been sworn in before. Uh, yes, I was on one of the initial hearings uh, a couple of meetings ago, okay. Um, okay. but I'd be happy to get sworn in again. If okay, Scott, fine. you've been yeah. sworn in, haven't you? Yes, I, I've been there every meeting. Okay, all right. I think we're good. I think we're good. Okay, so it's clear what you need to do, what we're asking you to do, and it um, uh, sounds like it's time now to move on to a discussion of zoning with Paul Connor. Paul, are you with us? Oh, I was supposed to text him when we were getting ready. Sorry, I failed. Oh, no, I'm here. Hi, Paul. Consider yourself text. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just one moment here. Let me just get myself organized for a moment. Paul, when Paul gets organized, is there a particular sheet that I should show at this time, or? Um, I would be ready with a couple. There's um, some C1LR concepts. 
And is there, is this, Paul, are you presenting zoning in relation to one of the staff comments section? Yeah, uh, basically what I wanted to do was just take uh, a, a very short period of time to give an introduction to your discussion about the C1LR area. So a series of staff notes beginning on, I believe it's page five, um, to talk about um, different aspects of the uh, C1LR area. Uh, sorry, page seven. Um, but this is sort of an introduction to that. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, um, you know, I guess what I wanted to do, and thank you for giving me a few minutes to just give a, a little bit of a, a broad um, big picture here. Uh, you, you know, um, Delilah, why don't you um, pull, turn off the uh, screen share because I'm going to show a couple of things. I'd like to just chat for a minute first. Great. Thank you. Um, so the C1 LR district is, um, there's only one place that it exists in the city and it's at this intersection. And um, the, it, it's, it's sort of, sort of a dual purpose. It's commercial one, which is the um, primary zoning district that, elists, that exists along uh, Shelburne Road and portions of Williston Road. And it says limited, um, limited retail, that's the LR. And the purpose statement, which is in your packet, describes um, that it is uh, encouraging general retail, specific intersections in the city to serve nearby residential areas. So that's one thing that I think, um, you know, just like to sort of keep in mind. Um, commercial areas are intended to serve the convenience shopping needs of local residents and employers, employees. Uh, location and design are intended to make accessible both by motorized vehicle and by foot thereby reducing traffic volume in the immediate vicinity. Um, it notes that um, there are uh, size limitations on certain land uses. And so, um, for example, uh, anything, the principal one is retail. So retail is limited to um, a total maximum square footage um, in the district. And I'm just going to double check that while we're speaking here. No, seven. So the it's limited to um, being no more than 5,000 square feet uh, gross floor area per tenant. So small type uses and a building footprint in a building footprint of 15,000 square feet. So just keeping that in mind, that doesn't mean that there couldn't be larger residential buildings. It couldn't mean that there couldn't be larger buildings that contain other components, but it is intended to scale a little bit to the um, to meet that purpose statement of, of serving um, uh, the the immediate neighborhood. So the second piece that I wanted to speak about um, as it relates to this is just thinking sort of from a, from a perspective of what this site is and what this is a junction of. Um, we're really excited to have the um, the folks from O'Brien Brothers thinking about this and you know creating this this neighborhood in this area that's great. Um, sort of a focal point of the hillside neighborhood of the uh, you know under review East um, Eastview neighborhood of various neighborhoods along um, uh, along uh, Kennedy Drive that have been around for a long time and also the employers and all the employees who are along Kimball Avenue. So it's sort of a juncture point of all of that. And so as you think about this as being sort of a, a, a hub and also a gateway, um, you know, we, we'd encourage you to think about, you know, how do you arrange this space to be that focal point, that destination from a commercial perspective? Um, the, you know, in terms of scale, I talked, I mentioned one thing about the, um, the retail you know, I'd also encourage the um, board to think in terms of housing, how, how to scale this appropriately to what's next to it, um, going up the hill and then in adjacencies. And, and um, you know, I think that there are some opportunities to think of some housing types um, and the applicant may very well already be thinking about these. We understand that they're, they're at a concept level but some housing types that we're not necessarily, necessarily seeing quite as frequently in the city. Things that might be, you know, not necessarily one, two, and three plexes at one end or 40 plexes at the other end, but things that can um, 
find this transition point, places like um, the uh, either mixed use buildings, like where the small dog electronics is at the corner of Pine and Flynn and Burlington, something that's um, residential. Um, Mark mentioned Winooski and its roundabout, just a block off that roundabout is uh, where the, the old Peking duck used to be. Um, there was an infill housing in there and then behind it is a series of very compact eight or 10 townhomes all um, grouped together. Um, here in South Burlington, there's a couple of examples that might not be on the fronting uh, side of Kimball Avenue, but might um, might be models to think about as you relate, as it connects back into the rest of the neighborhood, like the 12 plexes that are in South Village, um, which create a transition from single family housing and duplexes to, to a larger scale. Um, and, um, and and my last example was going to be that uh, the just around the corner over on 116, there's some great infill uh, sixplexes that have been um, built, um, in fact, by the O'Brien brothers. I say all this, and I want to be clear that we're not advocating for less density. Um, the, the zoning district allows for 12 units an acre. We have no problem with that, we're really just thinking about, you know, how do we arrange um, land uses to foster that pedestrian environment? And there's some great um, examples out there that could be um, 12 plexes, they may be even more, but have sort of a different facing. And so I'd just like you to consider that. And then th the last piece that I wanted to mention briefly was, um, as I was um, noting before, the sort of destination point. Um, there's sort of two large blocks in the C1LR area that are proposed by the applicant. Uh, the one that is um, further to the east has um, a concept of a little green area in the middle of it, and I think that you know that's a that's a really neat feature. And um, you know I, I would encourage board and the applicant to um, consider on the uh, piece that is closest to the intersection of um, Kimball and Kennedy, what design features that don't have to be determined now, but can be sort of put into the, into the design um, palette essentially, can be put in to, to unify this area, to not have it be a series of buildings, but rather have it be a destination neighborhood, have a civic spaces that make it, make it that destination. So as you think about um, the applicant's proposal, which we support, of um, of coming up with sort of a, a design palette, a, a set of criteria that would then move forward um, into uh, future phases of design that you consider some of these parameters um, in addition to the um, building envelope standards that the applicant has come up with, which we think you know have has some strong merit to them. So that's kind of my introduction. Um, Marla, did I miss any points that I said I would talk about? Uh, Marla, are you muted? Sorry, thank you. Um, one of the other things I wrote down, I don't know what I meant by it, is street presence comma parking as indicators. That's the only other thing. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, as I mentioned, you know, thinking about this as a gateway, thinking about how to um, make sure that it is um, both from the intersection that, that Delilah has shown up of Kim and Kennedy, that there's a strong presence there, but also that it's creating an, an inviting environment. And, you know, we understand we're not blind to the fact that there is um, a strong need for parking with any development, um, but how does it get um, sort of tucked in a manner that it's not a dominant feature. And, you know, what parameters would the board want to think about to support that? So um, the one other example I wanted to give you, I, I gave a few examples of that sort of mixed scale housing on the sort of creating a focal point side. Um, some members of the board I know were, were on a few years ago when the Larkin Terrace project was first proposed. There's one building there now, um, corner of Fayette and, and uh, Shelburne. And one of the components that the applicant presented at that time was a unifying feature through the whole thing of a um, pedestrian walkway, sort of an axis that goes through it. And the parking arranges itself so that 
it can go over it and it goes through it, but it's a very strong um, civic component that has benches through it and that kind of thing. And it really sort of draws people or will as the project is, is evolved, draws people through um, in addition to having the, um, the street now. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel as though it's dominated by a parking area. So um, again, it's early in the project for these folks. Um, we're not uh, recommending that they do a full design for the project, but as you think about the parameters and the, um, uh, the expectations that would come out, you could consider things like um, there should be a you know a strong civic component that connects it through or a certain size or 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 um things like that the applicant has proposed some street presence that you'll get into specifically um and and a number of design criteria which um we urge them to do and is a, a great starting point for this discussion so that's what i've got so Paul, would it be appropriate to now step through the C1LR staff comments that begin on page eight of the packet? Uh, sure. Um, May we just take a brief um, pause and ask the applicant if they have any questions of Paul at this point? Yeah, so this is Evan. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate you know everything Paul said. I think that Generally speaking, we're pretty aligned on our thoughts with, with city staff here. I mean, the the what we've kind of internally referred to as the commercial corner has always been the focal point of the development. And just kind of stepping back and looking at the broader development, you know, the, the vision has always been to have a variety of living styles, have a variety of employment centers, uh, and then the kind of commercial slash retail amenities that would serve the, you know, this community and sort of the broader community. And in keeping with the existing uh, development pattern at the south end of the site, we chose to, again, you know, with the uh, existing hillside development, we really stripped a lot of the existing density there and shifted it north into that uh, six lot subdivision of the commercial uh, slash multifamily subdivision, and then really concentrated on kind of gaining density uh, you know, bigger buildings, more commercial focus as we got to that Kimball frontage, because you're going from really a residential uh, kind of style at the south end of Old Farm Road and, and closer to the old uh, condo complexes along Kennedy, and then getting more commercialized as you get uh, closer to the Kimball frontage. So it seems like a natural tra transition, but it also provides a lot of, again, kind of uh, living opportunities in a variety of different manners. So, you know, I, I think that everything that Paul said, we're generally in favor of, you know, without getting into specifics. I think that's kind of the general feel, and we feel that that Kimball uh, Old Farm Road reorientation is truly the gateway to this site, along with, you know, I think that the, the Kennedy Two Brothers access is also, you know, pretty significant access, but I think the Kimball Kennedy, because it, it, it goes into that commercial corner, is really sort of the focal point from our perspective, and, and I think we're aligned and, you know, coming up with some form of, you know, landscape design slash, uh, you know, pedestrian amenities, et cetera, that has, has some sort of consistency as it goes throughout the development. So appreciate Paul kind of giving that preamble and uh, I'll just turn it back to you, Don. Thank you, Evan. Okay, let's, um, let's turn to the staff comments. We can have them on the screen, please. I don't have another screen with me tonight. So, did Paul, hey, Don? You say something? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, can I interject on a on a separate topic um, just for ten seconds here? I, I apologize, but um, I wanted to just note uh, we had a conversation. We've had a few conversations with folks. This is on a separate item on the agenda um, related to the sidewalk and rec path facility um, on Old Farm Road, sort of heading south in the project. And um, we had we've had some really uh, productive and, and thoughtful discussions. We also got some input from in a letter from other neighbors. Um, we let the neighbors that we spoke with today know that um, in out of respect for the fact that they gave us some ideas just today, um, some other neighbors gave feedback just the other day and the applicants thinking about this that um, we told them that we would not get into this discussion tonight. We really want to let people have a chance to think about 
um, all, us think about the feedback that they gave us, us um, them thinking about the discussion. So I just wanted, if anybody was sticking on the agenda tonight just for that item, um, to say that we'd recommend that be continued to a future night. Thank you, Paul. So what that means is we will not be closing this preliminary plat tonight. We'll be continuing it. But I think that's very fair. Thank you. Right. So we're taking the opportunity to sort of digest the information that we've gotten. The applicants taking the opportunity to digest the information that they've gotten, um, and we'll come into the continued meeting, you know, much more prepared to have to have a continued conversation about the rec paths and sidewalks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we picking up at uh, number thirty-two? Uh, hey, sorry, Don. Not to belabor the point, but would it be possible? Um, you know, there are quite a few neighbors on to, to let folks know when that continued date would be in case they don't want to hang around until the end of the meeting. Good question, Andrew. Sure. Um, so we didn't have been doing, which is save time as the future agenda. So unfortunately, I don't have any room until July 6th, which is one month out. So it'll have to be July 6th. Let me say that in a shorter way. <laughs> Great. It was time for the traffic memo. Great. Okay. Thank you. Shall we turn to the comments? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait. Um, someone raised their hand and I don't know your name, and I can't see you anymore. Uh, whoever just raised their hand, would you please identify yourself? And um, I yes. I Hello. That was me. What is your name, please? Marla. Marla, do you know who that is who's trying to speak? Yeah, um, her name's Marla Weaver. Can you she's hear me? Butter. I think she's having trouble with her audio. Okay. Um, are, are you in a butter? Can you hear me? It, yeah, it's a little better. Try it again. Uh, I'm Mar I'm also Marla, but Marla Wiener. Okay. Um, I think you just were with us last week, weren't you? Marla Wiener. Yes. We can't hear you, Marla. It might make sense to turn off video. You think that'll help, Andrew? Sometimes. Oh, okay. Bandwidth issue. Marla, are you uh, with us? I think that we're going to have to ask you to submit your question or comments in writing to Marla Keene because we can't hear you. Yes. Is, is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. We look forward to hearing these. I, I just, I just, um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? We, we are having difficulty hearing you. Okay. Yes. I just, uh, thank you for, for we look forward okay. to hearing you. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, roll with the staff comments. Okay. All right. Okay, good, thanks. So I think we're, we're at 32 probably. Okay, <clears throat> talking about design guide, staff 
do you want me to read the comments or do people feel that they've had a chance to read them? So in the interest of time, we can go through them. What's the board's pleasure? Uh, no need to read them. Okay, thank you. That's my opinion. Uh, pardon me? Just my opinion, I'm just one member though. Okay, is there anyone who is opposed to me not reading these? Okay, let's go through them. I will uh, mention the, um, the topic and assume that everyone's read them. So number 32 is in, in regard to the design guide. And yes, yes. I will ask the applicants to comment. That seems in line with what Paul and Evan were talking about. Uh, I think it's just more in the spirit of getting the conversation started. I okay. Think I think we're good okay. on that. Good, thank you. All right, move on to 33. Um, this is in relation to um, intersections and gateways. It seems to me this also relates to what we just discussed, unless someone doesn't agree. Yeah, I I think it does. And, you know, I think um, to the point of, you know, how the intersection can serve as an attractive gateway, I mean, certainly uh, open to feedback um, from the board. You know, we have um, submitted some schematic layouts of the development uh, we've also submitted, you know, the regulating draft regulating plan or, you know, design guide as we're calling it. Um, you know, there are there are some challenges with this project. I think everybody, you know, probably is sick of hearing us talk about the fact that it's on a hill, um, but <laughs> it is on a hill and uh, that poses challenges. And, you know, the, in particular with the corner of Kimball and Kennedy, I'm not sure if you guys ever have looked at our site from the corner, but there is a, a very steep bank um, that goes up to the project site. And, you know, Scott would be more familiar with the grades than I am. We we did submit, and I think it would probably be good to just pull them up and show you guys um, the sections that we submitted just to get you sort of oriented to what the grade is doing and how it relates to the roadways that are adjacent to it. Um, I, if, if that's possible to pull up. Do you know where that would be, um, Andrew? We had submitted it as a supplemental prior to the 518 hearing. Um, I could email it again or uh, if you guys- Delilah, have... is, is it possible to find that? I believe it's like exhibit 42 or something. If you can hold just a second, please. Supplemental from 518? Yes, I believe so. Uh, Exhibit 41 to the application. Yeah, Delilah, you're better off going into the project folder and opening Exhibit 41. I don't see it. Oh, actually, there it is. It's page two of the supplemental from 518 if you're already in that file. Oh, I got it. Yeah, hold on. Oh, do you have the uh, first page in there? It shows where the sections are. Perfect. Can you zoom in a little bit? Where do you uh, want to go? Just uh, on anything. <laughs> just in. <laughs> there we go. So if you guys see the, um, the red lines that are drawn on this plan, just to kind of orient you to the sections that are on the next sheet. So you can see there's a section running essentially from uh, O'Brien Farm Road down to the corner of Kennedy and Kimball. There's a section basically running across the, the buildings on lot 22 and 23, uh, all the way down to Kimball Avenue. We have a section that's showing a little bit of what Scott was talking about earlier of how the road needs to sort of go into the hillside to climb at a grade that is acceptable to um, you know, all of the different road regulating agencies. And then there's a, another one further down the page that runs through sort of more toward the area where the, the proposed dog park and playground is across that section of road. Uh, and so if you go back to the next um, page, you can, you know, so this first section is running 
to the Kennedy and Kimball Drive, inter Kimball Ave intersection. So if you zoom in a little bit on just that upper portion, oops, yeah, you can you can kind of see, you know, that that's O'Brien Farm Road on your left hand side. So that's the elevation of O'Brien Farm Road, and you can see the elevation of Kennedy at, uh, down at the bottom, and you can see that bank that steps up pretty pretty quickly. Scott, do you know so where where approximately on this line would would one of those buildings be located? Is that shown on your solid line, sort of where the edge of the development is? So there there'd be you're you're crossing several buildings, but you know the the buildings along the uh, you know Kim, Kimball and Kennedy you know, would be to the to the screen right, and and for clarity, what that little dimension says at the end without zooming in that's that's 21 feet so basically we're talking about putting you know the the, the lower floor of a building or parking lot you know 21 feet above Kennedy Drive um sorry I just want to interject because I think this is obvious to some people who look at these kinds of plans every day but may not be obvious to everyone these sections have a vertical exaggeration of two to one which means that this that are shown on your page are actually half as steep as they appear to be. Okay. Thank you, Marla. <clears throat> yeah, we got to fit them on the. <laughs> so the uh, but the I think you know the point here is just to show so you can see how um, I think that if you zoom in the sort of the straight solid line is the proposed grading. Is that right? That's correct. And so you can kind of see, you know, on the one even below it, the section heading down toward Kimball Avenue, how the proposed parking area is ending up, you know, even slightly higher than the existing grade. Uh, and then, you know, would be would be sort of landscaped or banked down toward uh, Kimball Avenue. And so, you know, there are some questions later on in the staff comments about the on the the design guide, we've got this red line. It's like a landscaped you know, it's a, it's a buffer essentially. And there were some comments as to what that buffer was. And and what that is, is basically us saying, you know, we have, we're going to have to, to use this uh, slope to gain this grade. And somehow we need to, you know, we need to landscape that and use that to create this sort of sense of place that, that folks are talking about. And, and well, so- Can I, I rephrase what I think I just understood? Because it wasn't a hundred percent clear. Um, so what you're saying is that for the majority of the area in the C1LR, you're actually proposing to reduce, I wouldn't say level, but to reduce the grade and then catch up to existing grade at the far north end. Is that more or less what you're saying? I'm not sure. Scott, do you have a... I, I think that's true. And, and what it's being dictated by are roads that are already built. So we have, we have set grades over on Old Farm Road and the future Two Brothers Drive that are set. And if we're going to build parking lots, we can only so steep with across the road. We can't build parking at 10% grade, what some of these um, existing grades are. And so, you know, to build a functional project, we're going to be on a fill on the north end. And I think, you know, our intent would be, uh, you know, to to sort of figure out how to use that. I mean, everybody who's who's driven around enough can probably think of a place where they've seen, you know, a building off of a road that has a really attractive connection to the road. And I think, you know, we haven't gotten into that yet, um, but that would be our intent uh, to sort of figure out how to use this and to create, um, you know, an identity with with this hillside. I mean, it's certainly not um, going to be proposed to just be a, a meadow. Do you have any concepts yeah, for what that might be? Oh, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, like, we're kind of trying to construct a semi-urban environment. And, and visually, and again, I know it's just an intersection and there's office buildings nearby, but you're trying to create something new. 
I mean, the Hill in many ways is a real advantage. And I know this is a big stretch, but if you walk around New Orleans, what's the most engaging feature is all the balconies. And it makes it an exciting place to be, just people, and not just Mardi Gras, but in general. Or you think of other urban environments where there's balconies. So I could see something like a promenade or a restaurant deck at that corner. Again, it's hard to envision it, but if we think down the road when everything's built out, that might be a way to, in, in, other, in other words, it's not just a facade. It's some sort of public space or people are walking there or it's, you know, it's got tables, it's, it's got uh, uh, balustrades and bend, you know, uh, granite or something. It's some sort of communal gathering space. That it may be private, it may be a restaurant deck, but at least it would be something besides a big hill and then some blank facade or, or office building thing that doesn't really engage it, you know, so. So it's a thought or a balcony or something. It, it's all about how to make it interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's the height right. is an advantage in a way. The height, the height is a feature in and of itself right. Right. and all. So it, use it as best you can. I, I think that's great feedback. Um, and, you know, I would say to Mark's point, um, you know, no, we don't have, um, we don't have concepts of the certainly we certainly can produce that as part of the final plat application. I think, you know, we would, we would, we would be able to sort of come up with a design for this buffer, um, you know, of some sort or some sort of character images of things that, that we could, you know, do to sort of, to create that sort of environment you're talking about, Dan. You know, I just, um, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Dan. <clears throat> In fact, I would have to say I was driving around um, the neighborhood the other day and I thought I love the way it's fit into a hillside. I think hillsides can be very charming and very interesting. And um, I think that's a real asset. I'm sure it's a pain in the neck um, for development, but I think it's an asset and I think that it can be very interesting. Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, I have, I have a question. And it, it, I see Paul raising his hand, but I guess this would be sort of like Paul, Marla, applicant. You know, Paul, you mentioned that, you know, one of the light retail, the LR component of this is 5,000 square foot envelopes, no more than three, you know, envelopes or tenant spaces in one building, so 15,000 square feet, but plus other uses in bigger buildings. What are the other uses in the, in the bigger buildings? you know, in this district? Uh, sure, Mark. Um, largely speaking, um, the uses that are allowed in our main commercial districts are allowed here. Mm -hmm. um, so without, you know, going into detail, generally speaking, um, you know, service-based offices, medical offices, um, those are um, all permissible. I okay. think and is there a requirement the retail or... component of it was really um, intended to make sure that it's um, that the scale of retail is not um, you know completely outsized to the um, you know secondary node that this is in the city okay and it's, a, um, that it's not a target you know I'm not <laughs> yeah, got it. and is there a required mix of light retail to commercial there is not um, the you know the, that can be a discussion point for the board, but there's no required mixes of any of this in the in the um, in this district. Okay, and is there any residential allowed within this district? There is. It's allowed at 12 units an acre, so um, that's the same as um, portions of Williston Road and a little bit less than Shelburne Road. So it's it's substantial. Um, and as I said earlier, there's we're not intending to discourage residential. It's a great spot for it, but we would encourage the board and applicant to think about, you know, ways to break it up, especially where it um, might come in contact with the duplexes along um, Two Brothers Drive, dead end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead, Mark. You're the, you're I, the... I was just going to, I was just going to say that, you know, because with that information in mind of sort of like the mixed use development, you know, this obviously has some great opportunity to get some real vibrant mixed use going on, you know, with some residential, some retail and some office. So you have activity during the day, in the evening and at night that you don't just have this thing become a ghost town at 5.15 in the evening. Um, but it's also something that, you know, has some some revenue drive, but also has the support for both self-supported with some residential and commercial office space, but also for the, the development itself with some, some, you know, markets, some restaurants, you know, some, you know, ancillary shopping, retail, type thing. And I think with the hillside, as Dan was talking about, there's some great opportunity for, you know, playing off of it, you know, with having like some one story structure on the south side with two story on the north. Um, and instead of, you know, maybe building on fill, you get some underground parking on the lower level that, you know, you can play with the facades to have some open air parking opening out on the lower level with the, you know, retail office above it. Um, so you don't just get one big blank wall, you know, going up two stories on the north side of the development where you have one story on the south side, you know. So I, I just think that, yeah, you and you can tie it all together with some, you know, some paths and some, some, you know, landscaping that's like a, a vein that runs through, um, the six lots. So I, I think that this really does have a great opportunity to be like the, the, the gateway into the hillside development. And with the, the main new reconfigured um, O'Brien or Old Farm Road and the, the, the sort of the, the access points coming off of it going into the development, you know, you, I'd love, to, I, I'm excited to see sort of your preliminary sort of design concepts for it. Boy, I can tell you're an architect. That's great feedback and input, Mark. Any other discussion that the board wants to have before we move on? Okay, next staff comment, please. Paul, Paul had a comment. Oh, okay, go ahead, Paul. Thanks, Mark. Um, I just wanted to make a note um, to what um, um, uh, board member uh, Dan was uh, just speaking about that th there is um, we agree that there's some great opportunities here um, for you know take to take advantage of the um, of, of the slope I do think it's important that the board note that um, as the applicants described it and correct me if I'm wrong Andrew but in the image that you're seeing there the concept as shown would have the buildings beginning 20 feet above um, the elevation of Kimball Avenue. So that, that green space that you're seeing there, is that correct, Andrew? I think that's about right. Scott would be uh, more authoritative on that than me, but that, that is my understanding, about 20 feet. So I guess, you know, based on that, I would encourage the board and the applicant to really, you know, the um, design challenges also present really unique design opportunities. Um, but you know that's a that's a substantial elevation change of 20 feet before you start the building. So really think creatively about how to, um, you know, not have it be not have it have the feel of a wall. Mm -hmm. well, I think Paul, that's, that was my comment about if you put lower level parking on the on the, the ground level, you know, you wouldn't start with a wall. You might start with a column, a series of columns that opens into the parking. And the building can have balconies above that to break up. So you don't just get a wall starting 20 feet up. Um, you know, you, you can break up the facade and the elevation and the massing. And then you could also, you know, when I'm looking at this going down Kimball, the two long elongated buildings um, on the here. east side. Yeah you can get a great opportunity to get some pedestrian access into the C1LR there with some terrace steps and, you know, landscaping, as well as, you know, further down at the corner. So I think that there's some great ways to make the connections and not have the buildings feel as though you've got this, 
you know, tight slope up to a edge of a building and then go straight up 20 or 30 feet, um, which is going to have a negative impact on that facade elevation on the site. I think you have to find a way to communicate and engage on Kimball rather than turn your back on Kimball with this these buildings. Yeah, I appreciate Mark talking about terracing too, because that's always sort of been in my mind too, as to how to make that that slope interesting. I think you could do a lot with plantings there and kind of step it back gradually as you go up the hill and really make it interesting. And particularly on that, where the actual Kimball Kennedy intersection is, I think there's an opportunity to do something there. That's really cool. And you know, to Dan's point, we've always looked at this as, as the topography of the site as being a differentiator and a benefit to us. And while it does create its challenges, I think it does differentiate ourselves from a lot of other developments where you know they're they're flat and you can build on that site. But it, you know, I think the hillside is already achieved. Uh, Don pointed out a, a level of character that you don't typically see. Right. Okay. I'm wondering. I don't know if it's like outside of the scope of what you're able to do or would consider doing, um, but perhaps like commissioning murals on some of the large buildings um, and involving the local artist community could be a really cool way to sort of make the intersection more interesting and tie the project into the community in a different way. Hmm, interesting idea. Yeah, I would say to the point uh, of the staff comment and, and um, you know, to the point of getting something approved at final plat, um, you know, we, I think we would, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot that we can, you know, is sort of up in the air because we don't know what particular uses in the buildings are and, and we don't know a lot of things, but I think if we have a sort of established um, green belt here and Scott sort of understands what the grades look like, that we should be able to put together, you know, a, some sort of exhibit that can speak to like what that, what that might look like or, or would look like, you know, sort of depending on how specific we can get with with the sort of unknowns that we have. Um, but I think we could certainly come up with something and submit it with the final plat application that sort of looked at this, this setback area, uh, you know, from on Kimball and Kennedy and sort of ways to create connections at the points where we have the building frontages and sort of what that what that can look like, if that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, I, I think we can engage uh, our landscape architect, Wag Hodgson, to really uh, kind of put together some interesting concepts that might help to kind of illustrate what we're thinking. Great. Okay, let's move on. Thank you all for great input. Um, number, let's see. Uh, number 34, and this relates to facade. I, I feel like we've covered this. Would anyone um, disagree or have anything to add to this? Unfortunately, um, these staff comments are a little bit jumping around in terms of like big picture, little picture, big picture, little picture. This is a little picture comment um, where the applicant's table um, that, of the like design features um, says, you know, we'll have such and such percent glazing on the primary facade and such and such percent glazing on the secondary facade. This is a detailed comment um, pertaining to, well, what is a primary facade and what is a secondary facade? Um, yeah. so this comment is that all the facades, I'm gonna flip pages so I don't, I've lost it. Um, all the facades facing Kennedy, Kimball, and Old Farm um, generally fit with what we primary facades in other zoning districts. Um, the interior roadways would be considered secondary facades. So if there's no questions on that, um, then we can talk. Yeah, about I think that. so. Just to um, you know, do you guys have the uh, the actual plan that we made? The um, you know the like red, white, and blue, and black. Um, guide i guess it's, yeah. it's, it's sort of neither here nor there but the we had on the guide there's a line it's like a gray stripe line that is meant to indicate what side would be the primary facade and um on on the plan that gray and white stripe line goes along kennedy kimball and then up old farm road 
Uh, so we were envisioning the same as what you're saying. So the, you know, the, the secondary facades here are facing the parking areas essentially mm -hmm. in, the, in the way we have, out, you know, sort of envisioned the guide working. Okay. Uh, anything else board on that comment, staff comment? Let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> I have a comment on 35 um, and actually staff suggestion just above line, the red number 35 of staff could support a proposal to build out a percent of each facade with non-garage space. And I'd add maybe ask both Paul and Marla on this a little bit. My feedback, why, well, I get the point that we don't want garages to be dominant especially within the residential context. I mean, isn't part of the urban landscape also that I'm thinking of older urban landscapes, obviously, of look, there's the parking garage entrance. And while we don't want it to dominate a building or a facade, it does it does signal to the uh, it does signal to the to the vehicle drivers and visitors where the parking is. So I, I would support a, you know, something that would, you know, keep that option open, albeit as long as it's not a big section of the facade. Okay, so, good. Dan, to, to your question, um, you know, I, I think we tried to write these as best we could to sort of present that there's some give and take here. Um, and I think, you know, part of the comment there was the intent is proposing um, on various lots, about 50% lot build out, and then the remainder of it, as as shown, could all be parking. They're then asking for a portion of each of the buildings to then be parking. So, you know, I think when when our our perspective to you would be um, that might be too much in total. So, you know, if a portion of the uh, area that is shown as parking, you know, right up to the street becomes a civic space, or if a portion of the, a greater portion of the, of the total frontage is a building, then, then, you know, we re, then we could certainly revisit the comment. But I think our, our concern is that if you took the total amount of the frontage and you said what portion of it is either structured parking or um, surface parking, it's a substantial amount. Yeah. Okay. Paul, thanks. I think that's a good comment and a good way to look at it because I think to Andrew and Evan's point or you know direction, you know you do need to do a test study because last thing you know as developers you don't want to build too much parking because structured parking is very expensive and you know surface parking is cheaper but you still have to do storm water and infrastructure to support it. Um, and I think if you do a successful mixed use development, you know, you could certainly do a certain amount of shared parking. And I myself would much rather see more structured parking below the buildings and give some flexibility to the percentage of facade, you know, that would allow it. And given the location of it, you know, on this diagram that we're looking at here with the red, black, and um, blue lines and to make the interior of these buildings have some selective parking as needed for sort of immediate, you know, short term use. Um, but to try to get some, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, that, that this sort of vein that goes through the whole all six lots gives some great opportunity to get rid of some of that surface parking, move it underneath the buildings and get like a common pedestrian, I would say landscape mall kind of feel going through these things to connect them all together. Um, which I know you have some topography to deal with, but I think it's probably relatively common at that, you know, elevation going through the center of those six lots um, parallel to Kimball. And I think that, you know, you do need to figure out how much parking you need so that yeah, you don't build too much. And I think right now it shows a lot of parking in the interior of these lots. Thanks, Mark. Uh, applicant, do you have anything to say in response to that? Uh, I would say, you know, we, we concur that we don't want to build 
you know, a single space more than we have to build. And so, you know, we will certainly do more analysis on, you know, as the buildings come to fruition, we actually have uses that would go into the buildings, you know, it, it, just so everybody's aware in the back of our minds. Um, and, and this is really a conversation for the, the planning commission and planning and zoning staff that'll take place at a later date, but we've always kind of coveted having some sort of community scale market on site, which the zoning regulations do not allow for. So if you think about like the Shelburne market or like a max market in Stowe, so that kind of scale of a market that could serve a community of this scale, which the current food hub allowance doesn't allow for those 5,000 square foot uh, units in a 15,000 square foot footprint. Again, it's not currently permissible, but it's a conversation for another day, but that's sort of also informed some of the, the layout here as well. Okay, thank you. Just to, to sort of, uh, you know, what uh, Delilah has the plan up at this point, I, I just kind of maybe want to clarify that the, you know, in the plan that we drew, so the plan you're looking at, the areas where the blue line is shown are areas where we're saying that within a building, and maybe we should clarify this to Paul's point, but that within a building that those areas would be where parking garage could be exposed to the street. And so, you know, we've analyzed this pretty carefully and determined that these buildings, you know, on these corners, you know, that this is the way the grading is going to work, right? So, so that underground parking is feasible and that in those locations, in order to build the buildings in this layout, roads in this layout, you would in fact have, you know, a, a walkout sort of basement condition in those locations, right? So, so there's no real other way to do it. So, th so then the, the the question is, how much of that parking should become some sort of you know street facing um, usable space and not be parking? Um, and I think you know, in the we had a lot of conversation about this in the, in the hillside project. Um, we had presented some really nice. Uh, exhibit in terms of how to screen the parking or how to make the parking lively, you know, using to Alyssa's point, I think we had, we had sort of looked at, you know, murals of some sort in the parking garage openings, uh, green screens, different uh, metal grates. Um, you know, I was in uh, my brother's house in, in uh, Newton this weekend and drove past a, a building on, on 95 that had uh, you know, it looked like it was part of the office and, and it was a parking garage and you couldn't really tell because the treatment on the openings was so similar to the glazing of the office windows. So, you know, I think our intention would be to, to treat these openings with all of these different things that we're showing here, these sort of unique and artsy ways of doing it. Um, but what we wanted to solidify with this plan was that, you know, in order for these roads to work and these buildings to work, these areas where the blue lines are shown are going to, to have a, you know, basement level parking. Um, and, and that's, that's why we, had, we had put it on there. Certainly if the, if the building is not, you know, built out to an extent that it's shown, the need for parking would lessen. Uh, and so I don't really know how to tie that together, but, you know, obviously we don't need as much parking if, if we're not um, building buildings of scale that are shown. Uh, and, you know, just another point on the plan while we're all looking at it. So, you know, the buildings that are shown are a concept. The regulating plan is saying that the dark black lines that you're seeing, like the big thick ones, those would be the basically the required frontage for the development, right? So any project we proposed, in no event would the building not cover that much of the street presence. It could certainly cover more. Um, and, you know, it doesn't match the buildings one for one because we're not, you know, it's a conceptual plan and we're not sure, you know, what those uses are going to be. And so we don't want to have ourselves into the most, you know, sort of to a single development plan, right? Um, and, and that's why the, the lines are a little smaller than the buildings that are shown. Um, and just like, since we're talking about it, there's another comment a, a little bit later on in regard to, well, if you don't build the buildings as big as you're showing and you only build them to the minimum, which is the black line that you've shown, you know, what are you going to do with all that other space? And I think that's a great point. And I, I, I don't think we have any opposition to saying, you know, if we 
you know, we can figure out a way to say, if we're not building the buildings as big as shown, and we are in fact just doing the minimum frontage, that, you know, the additional, some additional percentage should be created into some sort of a, you know, a, a public or civic space that creates something desirable, right? And it's not just an empty void, um, you know? So I think our intent is to develop it more in line with the conceptual plan shown. Um, and, and okay, so a little bit can we down. take a little pause and get some board feedback? Um because Andrew just made um, like three points and I just don't want to move on without the board weighing in on them. Um, and I, you know, Don, to be sensitive to your excellent timekeeping skills, um, I think that we're kind of covering staff comments 35 through 38 right now. So hopefully this kind of fits in. Great. Yeah, no, it's good. Good conversation. Um, so the first of Andrew's point was that there is idea that the parking will be screened, um, but it will represent a significant portion or could represent a significant portion of the street frontage. Um, and I think one of the feedback, one of the items that the board provided its feedback on Hillside was that that's okay for some of the, the building frontages, but a certain amount does also need to be functional building activated space rather than just screened space. Um, and so if we could go back to that color plan, um, you know, where, are, where is the board on this? And, you know, is this blue? Andrew, you're saying blue is what you're asking to be allowed to be building that is also parking, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think you know, to, to your point, I don't think that our request is that the entire blue area would be parking. Um, clearly, there's going to need to be building access in that area in the form of some percentage. Uh, so, you know, obviously, we're going to want doors to the building and, and the street presence, you know, entering and exiting. Um, similar to what we had in Hillside, right? We ended up with um, pedestrian, the two pedestrian accesses per side. Um, and I think we also ended up with some small, you know, sort of active uh, areas, um, if I'm remembering correct. Okay. The board's thoughts on, on whether they're on the right track. I mean, I think this is something we're definitely going to have to get more details on at final, but is, is this the right track? Should they be looking at, you know, prescribing, proposing a specific amount of area that can be parking and the remainder has to have be more active. Um, provide some feedback. I'm not opposed to some some of the, the blue there where the parking is as long as there's a second story on top of it or a story on top of it that draws the eye, you know, um, I definitely think it should, I like those screening concepts, whether it's plantings or metallic elements or other design features that hide the fact that there's a parking deck essentially there. Um, but there's gotta be something above it that, that, that draws the eye so that people don't realize it's a parking spot so that's my thought other members yeah don uh, i'll say that you know obviously i'd be rather hypocritical if i said i didn't support this since this is exactly what i described you know before i took a look at this blue green and you know black drawing yeah. um but i do I, you know i think that you know you, you know as the as the applicant has stated and as staff has brought up you know, we're going to have to have some actual building, the actual building facade connection along those, you know, lines to actually connect people from the street in um, and then break up the parking, you know, garage with the screening elements. And then to Dan's point, you know, that you then get some um, active engagement on the second floor, you know, whether it's retail, restaurant, decks, you know, exterior open air decks, you get, um, you know, 
retail or commercial building, you know, with, you know, but it's really going to come down to the details and the applicant knows that, you know, right. the, you know, the lobbies for entering the building and going up to the second floor from both the parking garage access as well as from street access. So I, I'm supportive of it, but I do recognize the need to not have it just be a long line of open air parking, you know, with even just screening, because I think that could start to get monot monotonous. Mm -hmm. You have to have the, the, the break in the facade with building elements and different materials. Some variety, okay. Yes, yep. Any other comments or thoughts? It's, it's a little hard to visualize, but I think based on what you're saying and describing, I think you're sort of on the right track. I'd be interested to see where you go with um, your designs. Okay, Marla, you you were on a roll. Go ahead. Um, the other thing that Andrew brought up was these thicker black lines um, being sort of the minimum frontage build out. Um, and then, you know, if the buildings are only the minimum, um, you know, does the entire remaining space become like a lawn or does it become a parking lot or does it become something more? Um, and I would love to see, you know, the applicant propose sort of a, maybe the, I'm just kind of spitballing here, but maybe the angle is, instead of having a minimum building, it's a maximum parking, and then the rest has to be building for civic space. Does that know. make sense? Evan, any I don't know. I'm asking you, does that make sense? <laughs> no, I mean, I, yeah, applicant, does that make sense to you? So, um, I'm sorry, a, a maximum parking, and then what was the, the last part? I didn't hear that. Well, and I'm just kind of making this up on the fly. Um, if the block areas are the minimum building and then you don't do any other building, you have a lot of things that aren't building along these frontage. Um, and so the project sort of lacks a the texture of the C1LR, which is, you know, predominantly commercial, with some limited residential and complementary to the adjoining neighborhood. Um, so how can, if the buildings end up being small, you know, maybe we post all discovered that we, our needs are a lot less and we need a lot less commercial stuff. What does all that other space become? And can maybe the angle is to say, well, instead of a minimum building, maybe it's a maximum parking frontage. And then, you know, the leftover space has to be civic space or a building or, you know, park or whatever, mm -hmm. um, rather than saying not minimum building. Yeah, I, I, Evan, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Read a little bit on civic space. Mm -hmm. can, can you elaborate a little on civic space, I think was the... What do you mean by civic space? Um, um, I, I can answer that. So I guess what I would describe as being civic space is activated, um, uh, activated people environments in our buildings. There's lots of different ways of doing them. It could be a plaza, it could be a green, it could be art park, it can be a lot of different things, but it's, it's, it's not lawn, it's not a stormwater pond, it's a focal point that draws people in. Um, so, you know, th th does that provide you enough direction? Yeah, so, so, so essentially a, a built space that is public. I mean, I, you know, the thing that pops to my mind, maybe it's not a great example, but it's that, that kind of sculpture park that's over in front of the grocery store off Shelburne Road. It's in the, it's like stone gargoyles or something. Is that, is that a civic space kind of? It's exactly what everyone has in mind, Evan. <laughs> Um, can I comment on that this done? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Okay. I, I think that, you know, to Marla's point and to Andrew's point, you both are sort of describing the same thing. You know, Andrew was saying if they end up building just to the minimum building frontage, you know, the black lines, you know, they're not going to need all of the site for parking. 
and therefore they would you know end up doing something civic oriented you know so i think that they're you both are saying the same thing and i i do i agree i think that you know the last thing we want to do is end up seeing you know these minimally sized buildings based on the minimum needed but then because they're, they're, they're small structured building, you're not gonna end up getting structured parking. You're gonna need more park, surface parking um, because you can't do the support of the structured parking on small buildings. So, you know, I think that to Marla's point of if we end up doing these small building footprints, we wanna have a maximum parking requirement such that we do end up with enough volume and square footage space to get that civic element. And when I think of the civic element, I think of like a combination of, there's like three or four things I think of locally, you know, the, um, the strip of land between Trader Joe's and healthy living, that sort of sculpture landscapes, you know, um, park. I think of the um, Maple Tree Place, you know, plaza at the, um, the movie theater, you know, where yes, there's a lot of lawn, but there's the little amphitheater, there's the, sidewalks crisscrossing it and the benches and then i think of like the little gargoyles you know pocket park but i think that's something that ultimately yes can also support a farmer's market for south burlington you know which is not you know all lawn you know um, i think it's a good combination and a good blend that has a focal feel to it and that ties it all together and that's obviously quote unquote worst case scenario if you end up doing all the small thing but if you end up doing the big thing, I'd still love to see some sort of amalgam of that as well. So just to wrap up, because I do have to write the decision. Um, I think what I'm inclined to do based on the discussion is write that these are the principles and the numbers will be sorted out at Final Plot. Does that sound okay, everybody? It does sound good. Kind of high level. Talking from the board. Yep. Other? Okay. Anyone have a problem with that? No. Okay. All right. Moving on. Was there another um, topic you wanted to bring up, Marla? Um, I think Paul had wanted to touch on sort of unifying elements before we moved on or gateways. What number are we on? Um, I'm a little off script. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we just did 36. I believe I we just did right. 36. I think you're right, Andrew. So let's look at, uh, well, let me back up. Uh, Paul, did you have something you wanted to say about unifying elements? Um, I think, so I th there were two things that I wanted to say that, again, we're sort of picking amongst a bunch of the staff notes here. But um, one is, um, you know, one of the features of the um, urban design overlay district along Shelburne Road is making sure that buildings have strong um, entry points, that it's, it's a, a good either gateway into the building or gateway into the neighborhood like those two at the corner of Kimball Avenue and, um, and, uh, and Old Farm Road. And then related to that, recognizing the topography that exists, um, you know, having the applicant consider, you know, what, what's the sort of main street part of this? If it's going to be a mixed use environment, is that the, you know, is that the, is that the slope up, um, uh, up Old Farm Road where maybe that's a place where you really want to try to create that feel of this is the center of this whole thing? Um, uh, you know, recognizing that it's going to be challenging for it to be that where you've got a 20 foot elevation gain before you get to the buildings on Kimball Avenue. So you know, where, where's the point that's sort of like, this is the heart of it, where you might want to have a little bit more texture that people, you know, that, that invites the existence of a coffee shop, that invites the sort of, the, the, the focal point off which then um, the, the, the ribbon that Mark is talking about and or the, um, the uh, civic spaces kind of like grow from. Okay. Thank you. And I realize that I'm using a lot of very plenary words in, in front of the DRB, and I'm sure that you're glad that you don't have to hear those from me at all the meetings. But I think here's a good opportunity um, with an applicant that really wants to good, create a great design to right. think about it at this big scale for now. Right. Thank you for that. 
Okay, let's go back in to- terms of, uh, In terms of just clarifying that, I mean, our, our we do have that challenge along uh, Kennedy and Kimball Avenue with the grade change. I think our vision has been that, the, you know, the, the it used to be a four-way intersection, but now we have a civic space there that you can see where the pond is and there's some picnic tables and things in this rendering. Uh, but that three-way intersection is sort of that that area where the buildings are are at grade with the road and you can sort of create that space that where where everything is sort of kind of coming together. Where are you talking about? Uh, so it would be the intersection, the four-way intersection there uh, in the center of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those, and I think that the building, um, even the smaller commercial building closer to uh, Kimball Avenue is, is not much above, um, you know, there, there is some grade in there for sure, but it, it's not 20 feet. It's probably six or eight feet. So there's a lot better chance for a good connection uh, through there as well. Andrew, what type of um, traffic calming or signalization or traffic flow impediment are you gonna be having at that four-way intersection? Uh, so I think that it's, at this point, I mean, I think there were some staff comments early on that it would be designed to have a traffic light um, in the future if it were needed. Um, mm -hmm. So it would have that sort of geometry and availability, uh, but that, you know, currently I think it's a stopped controlled. Um, okay. You know, and I, I think I imagine we'll do, you know, raised speed bumps and yeah. uh, raised crosswalks and. Yeah. I mean, I know this goes to public work standards, but, you know, I just think that that considering you have three sort of prominent buildings and then the, you know, the stormwater pond with the picnic tables, I see that intersection as a great opportunity to do like a, a differentiated color paving or, or asphalt or something to tie all those four corners together and make it more pedestrian friendly, you know, to, for, for traffic, for pedestrian flow, you know? Yeah. If you could imagine what we're talking about, where the whole intersection is either painted or different colored pavers, you know, just so that people recognize that it's all tied together. Yep. Great suggestion. Yeah, we, we will absolutely, uh, you know, be able to sort of propose some things along those lines. I, I think that's in line with our thinking. And I seem to recall a comment from Justin about special paving and what we were talking about. So mm -hmm. we already proposed it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay. we we certainly need to get into that detail. Yeah. All right, Marla, anything else that was triggered in your mind that you want to bring up before we move on? I think we should move on to, what are we on, 39? Okay. Um, I'll dive in with a question just to keep it moving. Um, so is the setback is the is the standard 30 feet and then I guess it's kind of hard to visualize without a mock-up but does a, a short I mean are we if we're trying to create an urban environment wouldn't we want a short setback of 0 to 12 Marla you want to weigh in on that um, so zero to 12 was used in the T4 urban overlay district. Um, and there are very, very high standards for what the aesthetics of those buildings must be mm -hmm. or to have that setback. Um, it's more a comment that those two things need to go hand in hand. You know, you can't have, I don't know, an ordinary building and, and a zero foot. Back. Well, it, it yeah, sounds like the application is clearly presented is pr proposing to have a very high quality street presence. So having those two go hand in hand seems like it would work here. Right, right. Makes sense, applicant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and just just for reference, I don't know if Andrew said this in the beginning, but uh, you know, we, this this framework was a large part influenced by the form-based code district, which you know, the city put a lot of effort into. So the, the T4 is a good reference there. Okay, great. 
All right, next. I seem to have lost the language in front of me. I'll, I'll dive in on number 40, if that's okay. Go ahead, go ahead Dan. Um, as, as somebody who was a, I won't say a young grad student, because I was 37 instead of 57 like I am now, but I, I remember I moved here in 2001, and I was a grad student at UVM and natural resource planning, and we heard, we saw a presentation by the South Village developers at the time, the folks from Maryland, I believe, Paul, or Paul might remember. And I always thought it was a cry and shame that there was no commercial use there. And I remember asking the developer as a grad student, like, why don't you go for a zoning change? Let's get a coffee shop or something in there with all that hundreds of units. And he said, well, that would be too difficult. And I, you know, any kind of zoning change would of course make the neighbors upset. So I would agree with uh, the comment there on number 40 about some sort of minimum amount of retail service space. The, the landscape is changing. You know, you've got all those people living in, a, for, for Vermont, an urban environment, the, the ability to get out of a, get out of a condo, get out of the townhouse in the dead of winter and do something, anything, get out of the house is key. So let's, uh, let's, let's, Let's make it feasible. I know. I know. There's certainly incentive to do as much residential as possible, um, but the desirability of the of the residential will increase to the extent that we have good commercial and retail activity. So, I like comment I number forty. I agree. I mean, the worst thing is having to go, you know, into town to get a lemon, as opposed to, you know, hopping on your bike and just riding down to a little, a smaller scale store. So I agree. Any other comments from the board? All right, 41. For what it's worth on that point, I don't, I don't think we have a strong pushback on that. I think we will have to be in streetscape and the whole purpose of this commercial corner is to have amenities that support and inspire people to want to live and buy homes at, at uh, O'Brien Farm. So, you know, if anything, I think, Dan, I'm going to call on you to join us in our planning commission uh, amendment request, because I think, if anything, we'd like to have some more opportunity to add some different types of retail and amenities to that space. Okay. Comment number 41. Uh, I guess I would say that, well, the detail of, of the percentage is obviously, you know, the devil's in the detail. So I, I guess we should, we should you know, take a look at that. I mean, for what it's worth, you know, in the plan that you're looking at, I think, you know, I think I said this in the application, but all of the residential density is contemplated in three or four of the buildings and there's, you know, nine shown. So I don't think that it's a question of there being, you know, additional commercial uses on site, um, but requirements can get tricky in, in terms of how they're worded and, you know, what specifically they're requiring and, you know, where. And, and so I think, you know, we'll just have to work through how to sort of structure that and, and we can make a proposal on that. Okay. Uh, comment number 42. Don, Don, I think Paul had a comment. Paul. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. I was just going to suggest, um, similar to how you have with a couple of other items, that um, the decision could write the principal and the applicant could be um, uh, asked to present a proposal at final plat about how they would address this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, just to underscore what the what's just been said, um, the commercial is a lot of things, but not all of commercial is a neighborhood destination. You know, right. office space is wonderful, it's an addition, but it's not necessarily a neighborhood destination. And right. so um, encourage the applicant to think about, you know, what kind of parameters would you recommend, propose that fits in with your, um, with your concept, understanding that, you know, this is a tricky subject area, but still one that um, it sounds like the board and you are committed to. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, any, it, let's, so uh, 42, um, the following related elements in the, in there's a table. Um, is there anything we need to discuss in the table? I think you uh, skipped uh, 41, Don, sorry, just. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Oh, we skipped 41? Okay, recommends board discuss limitations. Okay. Uh, as part of its design guide, consistent with the rest of East Bell and Hillside. So what are your thoughts about this? Andrew, Evan? Well, I think, you know, our, our sort of initial uh, take was that, you know, we think our project has been presented to you guys. You know, you've seen what we've done at Hillside, what we presented for the multifamily projects. Um, you know, we've set forth the standards that, that we wanted to have in place. I, I think we're comfortable with, with what we've presented. So I, I guess we'd want to hear your feedback in terms of, um, you know, prohibitions of specific building materials, um, you know, as, as relates to the, to the envelope. In the Fort Mays Code District, there's certain things that are prohibited. Um, vinyl siding is prohibited, um, you know, tar paper, sort of a foregone conclusion. Um, one that does get people is EFIS is also prohibited. What was that, Marla, the last part you said? Um, EFIS, it's some sort of, it's exterior, exterior insulation. insulation system. It's a follow through and stuff. Okay. Um, you know, in particular with with, uh, with EFIS and, and vinyl, I mean, you know, some of the homes, I mean, the homes in Hillside are vinyl sided. Um, and so I think, you know, and that architecture has, has come together rather well, I, you know, and I, I'm not, a, you know, lobbying for, for EFIS, but I also think that, you know, a blanket prohibition of a material, you know, when you're talking about three and four story buildings, you're talking about primary and secondary facades, uh, you know, just because you, you know, you could have brick for two stories on a building and the third and fourth story be, you know, EFIS that's set back after a water table. You know, they make EFIS that looks like metal panels now. They make vinyl that looks like clapboard. You know, there's, there's, materials are constantly evolving. They're constantly improving. You know, it's not your 1990s vinyl out there anymore. The stuff holds its color. It looks good. Um, you know, so I, I think our take would be that the board should, should look at the building's as they come in, you know, as they always do, and, um, you know, and make those determinations, you know, and in the process, rather than just saying, don't use a product, the product that might work well in the, in the situation. Board members, what do you think about that? Can you live with that? Can we live with that? I guess, you know, I mean, I, I'm really not a fan of IFAS big time, but I, I understand where the applicant's coming from, and I don't want to blanket reject stuff, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I totally get where staff is coming from with, with that comment. And, you know, this, there are secondary elevations and, you know, back rear elevations, but I don't think that this development and this sort of, you know, area I think we're trying to avoid having it have those sort of rear elevations. I don't see where we're going to end up having that given, you know, your prominence on Kimball, then the interior sort of parking, the sides of the buildings are going to be for circulation from Kimball up and up to the other areas. So, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, I'd rather, you know, I, I always think of vinyl and IFAS as sort of like your 25 to 50, you know, 25 to 40 year building and, you know, the brick and even like the cement board products and your other products are like your 50 plus year buildings. And, you know, I think this development wants to have the construction scale, aesthetic detailing of your 50 plus year sort of building and development so that it has that longevity feel from the get-go. Um, but again, I, I, like I said, I hate sort of ruling something out until we've seen it, but I don't want to sort of say, okay, let's see it. And then, you know, kind of hate it. So I think we feel, Mark, I think we feel the same way as you do uh, yeah. about, about those products. Uh, you know, what we've proposed, what you've seen us propose previously is, yeah. you know, a, a high quality architecture. I think yeah. we've committed to, you know, to delivering on that. Um, but, you know, this is, 
this is exactly what you said at the end, which is, you know, prohibiting something without seeing it or even knowing what that proposal might be or why it might be proposed. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think that the, the board necessarily has an obligation to approve the project at a later date if it right. meet your, you know, architectural standards. So yeah, I guess I just I'd like to see more information is what I'm saying. I don't want to rule something out and give a blanket comment because you're right, materials and technology and specifications are changing. You know, um, you know, but that said, there's certain vinyl products where the like hardy plank and cement boards from a cost standpoint are comparable, close, but provide a much far superior installation and sort of aesthetic look. So I, I guess I'll leave it as an open ended thing to say, let's see, let's see it in further detail. So, Mark, are you suggesting that we uh, deal with this at uh, final plat? I think we need to see it on a case by case basis. So, yeah, I, I, I would say deal with it at final plat. I'd like to see them propose it, you know, and give us more information about those material yeah. specifications. Um, okay. Because if we just say we're going to allow vinyl or we're going to allow IFAS or we're going to allow stucco, you know, it's sort of gives them an open-ended ability to install. But if we say, present it and let's see it, you know, and then hold them to it, that's a different story. Can you live with that, guys? Yeah, I think yes. that makes sense. I, I think that we're, we would, that's our expectation. We'll make a presentation of a, of a specific project at the point the details are known and that, that you guys will have the ability to, you know, accept or, or push back on it. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm more comfortable with that. Paul. Um, I might recommend, um, given that what the applicant is asking for out of this preliminary and final plat is not the actual buildings, but but the design parameters, right. um, if the board doesn't want to speak about specific materials, and I completely understand that, maybe some verbiage as a condition that talks about mm -hmm. what, that somehow captures what Mark just described. Yeah an expectation of quality um, so that, you know, if it's an entirely new board and different applicants eight years from now, that it's uh, it's a known, you know, it's a known expectation. Sure. How we about the term? It's no product. Tacky. Go ahead, Mark. I sorry. Say it's, it's no material we've ever seen on a big box store. Uh. Sounds good. So as we move on to self comment number 42, um, we have discussed many of the things in the table and I would say we only need to discuss the first, the second to last and the last of the things in the table. So the first one pertains to um, the number of stories and the su staff suggestion is that there should be a, not just a maximum number of stories but a minimum number of stories as well. Yeah. Could we have the table up in front of us, please, Delilah? Thank you, everyone. Okay, number of stories. Uh, enlarge this. Uh, applicant, what are your thoughts about um, a two-story minimum for street-facing facades. We're fine with that. Okay. Yeah, I think I guess, the, I guess the one question would be on, on the two-story minimum is, uh, you know, we would like to have the ability, you know, if, if you had a pharmacy come in and they can't live with, you know, an occupied second story, could it be uh, a fall second story or a second story, you know, facade that's not necessarily occupied? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a couple examples of that in the city. I think the CVS on Williston Road has a, a big, um, you know, false second story. Trader Joe's has a false second story. Uh, you know, so something like that, I think, was our concern in initially not saying there would be a two-story minimum. Mm -hmm. For instance, if this market ever came into fruition, um, you know, most, most of the time, supermarkets are one story. Right, right. Okay, so you can figure that out. Yeah, so that gives you some great opportunity to get some class story windows with some natural lighting into the into the 
retail space below. Yeah, if that if with that you know caveat, if it as long as it's not required to be an occupied story, I think that that that's we're on board. Yeah. Okay. All right, Marla, you said the second one, so. Uh, uh, the last. Pardon me. Um, what, but before you leave that you subject, there was, there was a second half of that first one, which was if the building's very tall, to consider some step backs. Yes. Yeah, I think you said the fifth story would have to be stepped back, and and that's fine. We're fine. Well, and I guess I'd, I'd recommend that the board have this discussion. You know, given the especially given you know the prominence of some of the inter the the heights and things, you may want to think about. You know, maybe in some cases it's less than that. Um, so I, I guess I'd encourage the board to have a, a bit of a dialogue about what kind of urban feel you want to encourage, or or have the applicant propose to you. Okay, well, I, mean, I, I, I like the idea of stepping it back if you get up to the fifth story because, you know, it, it gives a great opportunity to to get some engagement. You know, an exterior deck, about you know, large balcony you know, an outdoor space up there. You can do some, you know, or potentially partial green roof to really break up the facade. Um, you have a huge number of, you know, variety of things that you can do with this that will only enhance the buildings um, sure. and not give our, you just a five-story wall. Our own little high line. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I I, I think we, you know, we're, like I said, we're on board with that. We can amend the design guide at Final Plat to have that setback built into it. Okay. And, and just one more on that same topic. Um, I mentioned earlier about, um, you know, especially an area like the Dead End um, Brothers Drive extension. On one side of the street, you've got duplexes. On the other side, the applicant is proposing potential four floor, four story buildings. Um, you know, there's some really good design features that can make that much less imposing. Um, mentioned, for example, the uh, the small dog electronics building um, mm -hmm. at the corner of Flynn and Pine. Um, unless you're really closely paying attention, nobody knows that there's a four story on the top of that. You really mm -hmm. step back and look at it. I didn't notice it till about the 20th time I went by, but there is a four story there. It's just tucked a little back and it gives a little bit you know, the scale makes it less jarring to across the street. So I guess, you know, especially where there's transitions to much lower density things immediately next door, thinking about not having these big juxtapositions. Great suggestion. Okay. Can I just interject before we move on to the next one? Sure. Um, I'm gonna be pedantic and annoying and I'm sorry. Um, we were doing really, really well with reviewing, um, having conversations with the board, and I just want to make sure that you know these are comments for the board's discussion um, with asking applicant questions rather than the other way around. Say that so, again, Marla. You I broke just want up. to redirect and make sure that these are discussions with the applicant, with the board, and then the applicant is here to answer questions rather than the other way around. I apologize for being overly pandemic. I'm not very good at <laughs> subtle, but I just want to. Know. Okay. All right. Let's go back to the table. Do you mind if we just go row by row since this is somewhat new to me? Um, sure. So the, um, the, the, the second row about the prohibiting street facing first story garage, I'm kind of confused because in the other diagrams you were looking at, it did seem like, I mean, obviously we don't want a single story garage, but it looked like we were talking about a garage first floor deck that would be screened. So I'm kind of confused. Yeah, so it seems um, contradictory. Right, and it is. Um, you're absolutely correct. When we wrote these staff comments, we were thinking the board would not be okay with having the garages as they showed them. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, next one. Didn't you think we had covered this, Marla? The next two. Yes. And actually, it was the last one you thought we hadn't covered. Street tree. The last minutes. two. Can I, last two. Okay. can I ask about? Can I ask about the uh, the parking 
the sure. about the parking one. The boat uh, staff recommends the board establish a maximum amount of surface parking in this area. Do we have some sort of formula, or do we have the staff have some rough suggestion of what that maximum amount would be? Is it a percentage basis? Is it a percentage of the overall square footage of the building or how, how do you determine that? I think I'm going to use what we talked about before with the principles that, um, you know, this should have the feel while parking is okay facing the street. Um, it should have a lot of breaks in it and um, should have interest on the second story. Um, so basically in writing the decision, I'll lay out the principles and then leave it to find that to decide if we want to establish it. And Dan, Sounds I would good. just add to it. I, I think Mark had a really um, uh, a really thoughtful comment earlier on this subject that the scale of the development on this will, you know, there's sort of a tipping point that if there's not enough development, it won't it won't um, justify uh, structured parking. And so, you know, ensuring right. that the tools that you put in place. Um, it's economically viable to do the structured parking, which then eliminates some of the need for surface parking and lets it be building, lets it be civic space. Um, gotcha. So just reinforcing um, what Mark described much more eloquently than we could. Well, that's a first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Dan, do you have any others before we get to the last? Yeah, I, just, I just have a just would be a question for the applicant. Uh, Fifty foot spacing. What was your what was your rationale for asking for that on the street trees? I you know, I presume that it came out of the the form based code script that I was looking at, but maybe I read it wrong. So I I, I think that that it was what was in the uh, code chart. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know. I don't think I changed it to 50, but, you know, 30 is fine, so. Because we would like 30. If there's one thing that I can tell you for certain, it is that the minimum landscape requirements for buildings of this size are so high that we could plant a street tree every two feet and probably still have that be asking you to use it to buy an art sculpture. So yeah. <laughs> I think uh, we can do 30 feet for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, and do we need to talk about the uninterrupted sidewalk width? I would like to. Um, okay. So they're proposing to use some of the sidewalk width for um, what we just defined as civic spaces. Um, you know, is there a minimum sort of available pedestrian way that should be available? That was poorly phrased. You're you're breaking up, Marla. A minimum pedestrian yeah. width? Yeah. I, I, I mean, wouldn't five feet be typical as your minimum? And then you can elongate it for sort of the cafe, bicycle parking, you know, can meander in and out from that. but there should be a core width of at least five feet for a straight sidewalk. I think that was the question. That's sort of a standard. Um, sure. but we would want to see more in, to enhance as the gateway feature or is are all the other elements taken together adequate to do that? I personally kind of feel like they're adequate, but I'd certainly entertain other thoughts from board members, other board members. Don't all speak at once. <laughs> Alyssa, Dan, I mean, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you want a minimum of five feet just for pure circulation, but that doesn't mean that's the right width, uninterrupted width for this development, you know. Um, but typically when you get a much deeper uninterrupted sidewalk, it's because you're designing ancillary uses into that space. So if we're talking about having those uses meander in and out of the uninterrupted sidewalk, 
you know, I, I'm not sure if we, you know, then have say, okay, let's have eight feet and then you can have it widened in other areas. But, you know, I think that five feet of uninterrupted sidewalk um, is, is decent. And then you've got your other uses for the art benches, the cafes, the bike parking, the sculpture areas. And that also gives you some nice space for some landscape buffering between the parking areas and the buildings. I mean, that's just my thought, but I could clearly be swayed a much wider, you know, standard width. I would agree with that five feet. And I think to some extent, this will be self-regulating a little bit, so. Yeah, it's gonna be market driven what the building, the site and the landscape connection features are gonna kind of self-design it into that sidewalk. Correct. Okay, Alyssa, anything to add to that? Nope, sounds good to me. Okay, all right, let's so move we're, on. We're on board with the five feet, sounds great. All right, 43, um, walking trail configuration in the loop. So we're now moving on to the IC zoning district, um, which is if we could kind of show the plan on that guy, um, that's 74 of the packet. So we're out of the north end and we're now at the east side of the project. Um, and this project connects to the residential portion of the project and the commercial CMLR only by pedestrian paths. There is no proposed vehicular motor vehicle connectivity. And just to kind of set up that context. Um, so the first comment. Oh dear. Lost it. Um, so the first comment was about the paths. Um, in the previous configuration, <clears throat> roadway was much farther east, sort of along the center of the area that's now proposed for development. And that walking path that Delilah has highlighted was a big loop. Um, so the question here is, um, has, should that loop come back in at the south end to that legacy farm road extension? And Delilah, I've lost my annotation tools somehow. There we go. Try again. Thank you. So the question here is, there was sort of a path here as well. Obviously it doesn't work exactly with that building, but should that be put back or is this okay? Hmm. So that, so the, the, the middle yellow, you know, loop path, you know, that, that, that goes up to, um, I forgot the name of that road right above, but that connects to another path that goes up further. The red line that you drew, does that connect to another path of some sort, or is that just sort of like the end of the neighborhood, and therefore the thought is that it should connect to the path system? Yeah, um, it doesn't connect to a path. Mm -hmm. it connects to a sidewalk. Okay. Whereas the one in the center, you're correct, does connect to another path. Okay. And there is a sidewalk that runs all along the IC road, correct? Or yeah. back up or something, okay. And so the two yellow lines come off of that rec path sidewalk and go to the neighborhood and go over to the um, IC, no, the, the, the LR, one, the C1 LR district. So the question I guess I have is, how is the additional red path sort of a benefit as opposed to just sort of going along the sidewalk in that neighborhood yeah. to the other yellow path that connects into the rest of the development? That's a great question, Mark. I don't see that it does. 
follow up um, question, Don. Yeah, I guess, Donna, what I would suggest is, um, I think Marla drew sort of a, 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 um, a north-south piece there, but given the sidewalk, I think some of what we were thinking was a connection from Legacy Farm Extension down to that sidewalk to create another walking loop so yeah. that, you know, right. frankly, so the residents that. don't have boredom of doing the same exact loop every time. So yeah. just that second one that Marla just drew. Right, that okay. makes more sense to me. Yeah, so you don't have the long leg of your red L. You just go from um, the road down to the sidewalk. Right. And then the sidewalk itself connects to the other two yellow um, paths. That right. I agree with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a waste otherwise. Yeah. Highest question on that would would stairs be allowable there? Because we have, we have significant very significant grade change between those two spots. You're breaking up, Evan. Uh, or, or was that That's Andrew? Scott. It's Scott. Um, Scott. There's a significant grade change between those, right. and you would need stairs to do that. We don't have room to grade it out without you losing um, houses. But, you know, I think that that's that's sort of, um, you know, one of the reasons why we didn't put the connection there. I guess, you know, we're also, you know, this path is stopping at the edge of our property. You know, the rec path also continues through and the road right away is, you know, presumably getting built through. And there may be a, a way to sort of, you know, the, the logical place for that connection would be along the future roadway connection that, you know, is shown on our on our plan for, you know, future connectivity of Legacy Farm Road to the IC Road. You know, that connection, you know, would, if you ran it along that road, would be fairly straightforward and, and not much longer than that straight line drawn there. I wonder if um, you could, Andrew, describe what you are thinking those yellow lines look like. Are they, you know, a three foot dirt path or are they like an eight foot paved path? Well, so and so one other piece that I, I also did forgot to mention is that, you know, we did try to limit the number of things in this wildlife corridor that the Natural Resource Committee was keen on replanting and keeping, you know, fairly dense. You know, that was some feedback that we got from them. Um, you know, the two points crossing it currently are the two yellow lines shown. Um, the yellow line, the shorter yellow line that's like arching up the hill is a is the proposed east west shared use path connection so um you know i i don't know the width of that you know there's eight eight or ten feet you know i think we would prefer eight uh, you know we've spent some feedback about ten you know we need to look at whether you know what that does and, and how it works um, but the reason that it's cutting like on an angle is that in order to keep the slope you know in the parameters for the design of a shared use path we had to go you know on that that weird angle. Um, and so that that trail on the left is a shared use path. The other one is is likely, I would say that we would keep it, you know, gravel or something like that. Um, you know, it could be three feet wide, it could be five feet wide. I don't think we, I don't know, I don't know that we, that, you know, that we have a, an opinion. I'd say five, just because that's what a sidewalk is. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so that would be probably gravel. Uh, you know, we could look at paving it um, if that's useful. Uh, so, that's also connecting over to the dog path or dog park area. So, you know, after hours, the presumably those commercial parking lots might be overflow for. You know, you get off work, you take your dog over there to the dog park, you park at one of those lots. Right. So I think the gravel path might not be a bad idea. So board with a little bit more information about the vision um what are your thoughts hey marla were you asking the board or the applicant that question oh the board sorry i didn't realize it didn't come across so with the more oh. information from the applicant about their vision board what do you think about um southernmost red line Hmm. Well, I guess one question I would have is if we do we're sort of required at this stage rather than, you know, 
requiring it at you know when we get the the adjacent development going in where the two roads are going to connect we do require it now does the city allow steps in sort of these sort of connection ref path type of things what i would say to that is that um i think in that scenario that we would expect that to be privately maintained um mm -hmm. this city um i can i don't usually try to speak for justin but i would say the city does not want to own stairs okay then i would say we wait and defer it to when the adjacent parcel gets developed and the roads connect we then will do the connection at that point then makes sense Likewise. Okay. Good. All right. Can we move on? Are we done with the chart tabled? Yep. So we're on staff comment 44. Um, and this comment is again sort of a before and after comparison. Um, Previously, the applicant had been proposing, you can kind of see it on the top of the page that July has up right now. The IC road was much farther south than it is now, or sorry, east, bottom of the page. Um, and they had entertained the idea of a road, or not, not a road, but a right of way through here to a path through here. And now it's become just a path and so this staff comment 44 is should this path include a right-of-way for a potential roadway connection and that was one of the comments provided by the board at an earlier hearing mm -hmm. is that though we recognize the applicant's testimony that this is steep um we don't know what the future will bring and so it would be good to have the ability to build a road should that become should that make sense later? And so now that this is much closer, should that still should that ability still exist without putting any any burden on the applicant to actually like design it or build it or anything? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say yes. I mean, I think why not? Yeah. I mean, I I think that what the only thing you're doing is you're sort of splitting the houses or you might lose a house to get that 60 foot right of way and to connect the you know to provide for that possible future connection um but i think that also allows for a you know a visual connection between the two developments even if a road never goes in you don't sort of have this wall of houses that you know you feel like you're tucking you're kind of going between two houses um to get down into the ic area it can so we we certainly i i think that's a great point about having that physical connection um you know that sort of visual space um you know we we took the right of way out because we provided a viable connection point mm -hmm. a hundred feet to the south of this um yeah. my understanding currently is that this is not a viable connection point for a road um it would be far too steep to actually ever be built um scott could speak to that and and you know what what, what is the the grade through there scott i mean is that road viable as a road so what what i'll what i'll say is that the rec path you're looking at to make those grades work we had to design most of it at a 10 percent grade which i think is okay for a rec path it would, it would not be acceptable for a road of this type and furthermore, the, what drives it again is if you're going to have intersections, you have to have the flat spaces at the intersections. And so if you do flat spots at each intersection on each road, you're going to end up with a section in the middle that is you know, completely unworkable. So I, I totally hear what Scott's saying, and but I, I think to staff's comment i think getting that 60 foot right of way just splits the houses what you know a little bit wider so that your rec path doesn't feel like it's going through someone's side yard and if something should happen or some change or something it does give the city that sort of 60 foot right of way connection between the two public rooms okay other members of the board I think it 
makes sense. It sounds like an engineering nightmare, but I think it makes sense. I mean, the the a lot of right of ways that we've provided in the project are smaller than 60 feet. 60 feet is is quite a large right of way that that would potentially you know result in losing homes along that roadway. Um, you know. Could we could we sort of look at trying to create the the connection and visual you know space that you're talking about? I mean you know I think that it could be done in less than 60 feet. Uh, is you know in a home, in a neighborhood where homes are 12 feet apart, you're talking about five times the width, um, you know, of a, of the normal space. Sure. No, I'm sorry. I could I could be convinced, especially given you're probably never going to be able to get a road in there, connecting it. So I think it's more of a a visual connection and a, an ability to not feel as though you're going in between someone's ha two houses. So if there's some sort of middle ground that allows you to not have it feel like you know there's a missing house, but it also not like you're going in between two houses. I think we'd be much more comfortable with that if, it, if it's more of just kind of creating a better entryway or through through way, uh, because the the other aspect of the right of way, 60 foot right of way in between two residential houses, is those two residential houses, they're going to have a lower sale and resale value by virtue of having a potential city road in between them. I mean, that's just the reality. Well, can I ask, I mean, Steph, is there, do you see the potential for ever putting a road there or is it just literally a 60 foot right away to potentially get a road there? I think um, to a certain degree, this was a shock comment. Um, we saw the change from the left drawing mm -hmm. to the right drawing and said, oh my God, we've lost all the best parts of the design. Right. Um, by moving the road. And then I think what Scott just said reminded us of the um, connection that we have now enabled south of the project on the left-hand side of the page. Right. Um, yeah. That becomes less of a concern. Okay. So I, I so feel we, okay with just widening it rather than providing a full right-of-way. Okay. And um, Mark, I would just add that, um, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree um, and, also to the point that um, I think Andrew made about, you know, people being surprised about rights of way between their homes, that whatever the applicant can do to be exceptionally clear that legacy farm extension will continue and will connect into the IC road. Um, you know, uh, we, we, you've been through this multiple times in the past and, you know, we, we, we don't want to be in a circumstance where those neighbors come and are are expressing surprise that that's connecting. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we just oh, like we, to we understand the concern. Much emphasis on that as we can. Yeah, we, yeah, we can. which is oftentimes <laughs> why we ask that the road be built right to the property line. Which I hate additional asphalt when you don't need it, but it also pre present prevents like. Future, wait, I didn't know that road was continuing, you know, but um, no. yeah, I agree with Paul's comment. And yeah, I think that we can certainly live without getting that 60 foot right away. And I think just widening it so that it's apparent that it's a rec path and it's connecting to different areas. Okay. Yeah. Great. All um, right. Just um, one last note on that. I know. Um, uh, a few folks have, have been in the neighborhood of Butler Farms where there's a right path that connects through the golf course. And though there is some width there, the neighbors on each side of it, you know, have expressed their displeasure for there being a wreck path in there. So having something that is sufficiently wide that people feel that they have their privacy and that there's a legitimate encouraged use wreck path is, is a key key component there. So thanks. I would agree with you on that, Paul, because I live in that neighborhood, so I go up into that bike path, and you're you're right. One side, you're literally looking into someone's living room windows, and on the other, you're literally right on someone's driveway. Um, uh, so yeah. There's very little buffer between the rec path and the adjoining properties. Okay. We'll take a hard look at it. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Shall we move on? 
to whoops, 40, Five. Nope, 45. Uh, discourage a heavy buffer in this area and instead encourage the homes to use lot 32 as their neighborhood play area. Uh, could you explain this a little, Marla, please? We have a visual that we submitted of the park. I think the next two comments are talking about it. You might want to pull up the um, the sketch. It might help you describe it as well, Marla. Yeah, I think that was at the end. Not all the way at the end, but close to the end. No, that's not right. I was... Uh, Unfortunately, don't have all these exhibit numbers memorized. It's well, like, we don't need the exhibit number. We need the page number. Don't have all those memorized either. <laughs> I thought this was your full-time job. Come on. Uh, um, oh, here it is. It's um, page 71. Oh, the landscape drawing, the color. Yep. Yeah. And then um, page 72 has sort of like a zoomed out. These are all the open space areas. Yeah, I think yeah. either one will work for them. So if I go back to the staff comment, staff comment says, Um, discourage a heavy, as previously noted, staff recommends the board discourage a heavy buffer in this area and instead encourage the homes on lot 33 to use lot 32 as their neighborhood play area. So in the concept on the previous page, it looks like um, the proposal is kind of opposite that. Um, you know, the board has spent a lot of time on other projects looking at um, so could you go to the previous page for me? Um, Say okay, that again, I had an interruption. Oh, oh. hi Lucy. <laughs> um, a lot of time on previous projects talking about like buildings having two fronts and this seemed like an opportunity for the same here. Which is lot 33 or 32, you know, if we're looking at the pretty landscape drawing. Mm -hmm. I'm um, sorry, my computer's um, having issues with this PDF. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and see if that fixes it because the documents, yeah, hold on. Go ahead and have your discussion. I'll, I'll try and fix this. I think those lots were the ones that are backing up to the barn, I think is the um, context. So I'm sharing, I'm really bad at sharing mm -hmm. and talking at the same time. But so lot 32 is these homes. Oh, I see. Okay. 33. So lot 32 is a, a series of homes. Got it. Okay. And 33 is this open okay. space. So what you're saying is we should make, we should encourage the developer or we should require to have more of an actual connection between lot 32 and 33 rather than segregating them and making lot 32 or 33 sort of isolated from those lots. Right, so maybe it's sidewalks that connect to this rec path, or, you know, having the rec path closer to the homes. Um, we've seen it on a lot of other projects. It seems like a good opportunity here as well. Yeah, I think that because makes sense. I, I do too, because it sort of reminds me of the, um, the cider mill development where you have the rec path that linearly runs along the uh, west side of it, where it's running the west side between cider mill and um, Dorset, you have the rec path. And it's sort of like it's, there's this sort of like buffer of whether it's wetlands or what, that really disconnects those those lots from the rec path area. And I think that, you know, somehow connecting it so that people feel as though they go out of their backyards, go out of their house, go to their backyard and go access that rec path, that rec recreational area is, would be a great amenity feel rather than segregating it off. Yeah. 
it's not very inviting the way it is now in in the picture. Yeah, I don't think that we disagree that folks should be able to, uh, you know, feel like they can connect to the to the bike path. You know, it's obviously an amenity. It's it's there, and people are going to be aware that it's going to be there when they buy those homes, right? Be comfortable with it. Um, you know, I think there's a balance that we need to strike between creating privacy for the homes in their backyard and people yeah. who barbecue on Saturday and not have public walking their dogs, you know, 10 feet away with no screening, uh, but also, for, you know, those windows of connection. Um, and I, I think that we, we, you know, this, this drawing doesn't do a great job of, of conveying it, but, but, you know, I think that would be sort of my take on it would be to say to the land architect, can you, you know, create privacy, but also create openings and connection and sort of, yeah. does that yeah, make sense? I think that it does. And I think that the, you know, there's the neighborhood directly to the north of other farms, Rye, the Rye development has that where the backyards of a lot of the houses are buffering, are bordering right on that sort of recreational area with the playground and the, the open space and the, the path that connects through there. Um, and, you know, some neighbors, some, because I walk through there all the time, some of the houses have embraced it and some have turned their back on it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's up to the develop, it's up to the, the homeowner to decide how they're going to do it. But I think the ones that sort of embrace it, sort of make it become more of an integral part of the neighborhood feel. And I would encourage that sort of to look at that from a landscape standpoint. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. All right. Any other comments or questions or thoughts about about this before we move on? Okay. I need to. Could we go back to the text, please, Delilah? Perfect. Um, okay. Forty six. Steph. Oh, I'm not going to read this. Uh, this is a revised proposal. Let's see. This is about the resident club, principally for public recreation. What about parking? Um, let's see. Evan and um, Andrew, what are your comments about the staff? So just just so this everybody... is one really for the board. Um, they have provided this um, open space area, and the board can only allow parking in the if the purpose of the law is for is principally for public recreation. So um, you know, is the board comfortable that making that call and saying that yeah, what they have is for public recreation? Marla, I'm sorry, would you explain that again? The board cannot do what? So this is one of the, um, one of the, you know, the three thou shalt never um, allow parking in the front, except when um, the principal use of the law is for public recreation. So okay. the board needs to be comfortable saying that the principal use is for public recreation. Has the applicant done enough to make that the case that the board can make that determination? Um, we might want to go back to that picture again. When you say public recreation, does that mean someone from Winooski could come and use it as well? Is it real public public? I guess that's a gray area. There is no definition beyond what's in the text of the comment. Right. Okay. That would, I guess I would ask, I, I would like a clarification on that. Is the, is, can we go to um, sheet 71 again, which shows the, that area with the parking in the front? Because I think that that, so is, and it shows it's a permeable picnic court, the old barn, the sledding hill, 
you know, the, the rec, rec path, the old silo repurposed, the practice field and winter skating park, skating rink, and there's a circular drop off. Is this for just the residents of O'Brien, you know, this hillside development, or is it open to the public for use? Um, the, the, the vision for this is that the, the park area is open to the general public, whereas right. if you recall, the original vision was that this was a private club space that was kind of an exclusive pool area, clubhouse, and yeah. we kind of rethought it. And, to, you know, just for kind of a comparison's sake, you know, Overlook Park is a little bit of an inspiration because this is a pretty important view shed, we believe, mm -hmm. for the city and for the public. And so we were trying to preserve that, um, but, you know, enhance it. But we want to be able to, I mean, we have an existing condition. We have an historic barn on site. Barn yeah. is set back from the road. And so, you know, putting the parking to the rear of the barn seems to be illogical because you would take up the park space and pick up the view. And it also just doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, but we would like to retain the possibility of, you know, an adaptive reuse of the barn at a later date. Could be an event venue, could be, you know, could be broken up into, you know, artist studio spaces and rented out, you know, kind of maker space style. It could be a daycare, could be a health club, you know, whatever. But the, the principal use I would suggest and propose is public recreation. It's open yeah. to the public and we're going to enhance it and put a bunch of landscaping dollars and design. So you got like the, the sledding hill, you know, like, you know, in the winter, there's probably what? three to five really good, well-known sledding hills on private land, but they're open for the public to go in and, you know, park and use like, you know, um, Burlington Country Club, you know, it's a private club, but in the winter it's drive in, park in their parking lot and go use their sledding hill. Um, the Shelburne uh, post office, same thing, you know, people park in that parking lot and go use that sledding hill. Is that sort of what you envision when you say, you know, it's open to the public, but the club itself might have some private, you know, use to it. Exactly. Okay. okay. Then I'm comfortable with the parking being in the front because anyone can go there and use it. Um, they might not be able to go in and use the club, but they can use the, the, the property, the open space. And I think it would be like a shame, shame to take up that back area with the beautiful views, and they are beautiful yeah. for a parking lot. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Okay, let's move on. Um, we're, moving on waiver requests. Um, um, we're moving on to the waiver requests. Um, and so I wonder if, let's see, is there a way to sort of consolidate some of this? Could you scroll down, please, Delilah? I mean, just, uh, Marla, to your point, uh, you know, comment 47, 48, and uh, waiver request 15, it looks like comment 49, you know, we're, we're in agreement with your conclusions on. Okay, so did the board want to discuss any of 47, 48, or 49 further? I would need to see them. Um, Delilah, could you please scroll down? I'm not seeing them. They're right in the modification of standards. Maybe Delilah's screen is frozen. There it goes. Okay, thanks. So, uh, staff. Can, so number number forty seven. Um, that can be done in final final plat. Applicant, are you are you good with that? Yep. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Forty eight. Uh, recommend or accept this request. Modify your findings to reflect. Uh, can you live with this? Forty eight. Yep. Yes. And then uh, 
What about 49? Yeah, I think we're okay with that. Okay. Any comments from the board about those three items? Seem all very reasonable. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Marla, do you have any questions? No, I think we're good. Okay, good. So I think there's one more. Number 50. There were ways to meet these criteria, and these criteria are related to the relationship of proposed structures to the site. The presence of an intervening open space and roadway reduces the needed reliance on architectural similarity. Staff continues to recommend the board deny this request. So the request being that um, waiver of the requirement to have the buildings in the IC zoning district have a relationship to the remainder of the PUD. Okay. Um, so, so if you could uh, stay on the text of the actual um, the comment there, um, you know, just because I think the full the full requirement, you know, we're asking for specifically, I think a waiver of, of, you know, just a pretty small portion of this. Um, so it, it says, you know, under the, I think, relationship should incur a relationship of structures and site to adjoining area. This the development review board shall encourage the use of a combination of common materials and architectural characteristics. Attractive transitions between buildings of different architectural styles. Proposed structures shall be related harmoniously to themselves, the terrain, the existing buildings and roads, and have a visual relationship to the proposed structures. You know, I, our concern here is just that we have an industrial commercial zoning district in the development. And we've put a, you know, 100 foot buffer and then a, a 50 or 60 foot wide city right of way and public road between those two uses. Uh, which aren't, that's an, and I don't think uh, it conveys, you know, the, the current configuration, right? But if if you're looking at the, the newest site plan, you'll see the, you know, you see the, the wildlife corridor, which is, you know, 100 plus feet wide, and then below that, uh, you know, a 60 foot wide road, and then you get into an industrial commercial zoning district. And for those projects to be, reviewed saying that they'll be encouraging a combination of common materials and architectural characteristics. It's just, I think that, you know, you could, you could waive the requirement or simply just provide some sort of finding or clarity that just says like, hey, we recognize that you can't make a single family home look like an industrial building. Um, and, and that, you know, the, that we've provided a buffer and we've provided a break and that, you know, and that the, the sort of incongruity of it is built into the PUD. And that's why we've sort of structured it this way, right? We're not proposing single family housing in that IC area. We're proposing a buffer, um, you know, to keep a separation because, you know, the types of uses that are allowed, like a lumber yard or a, a uh, you know, an RV dealership or, uh, uh, you know, these things are hard to make look like a single family home. And so I think that that's our concern. We're just a little, we're wondering how, how do we sort of not set ourselves up to not be able to pass this test in the future? So I don't read this as requiring you to make industrial buildings look like a single family home. I think the point of it is to make sure that things come together nicely. I don't think that you need a waiver of this recommend, um, of the requirement. I think that the way that you are proposing to transition things makes sense and that it's just there to make sure that the transitions are nice and are appropriate and that there's not something that's like glaringly hideous about what you're proposing to do. Not that like, you have to use the exact same materials on an industrial building as, you know, a single family home. So I have a question, and this is probably from Marla. 
Um, when we were reviewing the apartment buildings down O'Brien Farm Road that are kind of brick and urban looking, um, we talked about how that was intentional on the part of the applicant to, to make it blend with the further development um, down the line. Um, so how is this any different than that? I mean, that's a very different look than exists on O'Brien Farm Road or on the other parts of Hillside. How oh, is this different from that? I guess it's different. I'm not sure I can guess where you're going with this. I, um, well, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just trying to understand um, because I think when they designed those apartment buildings to look more urban, that was very intentional. And it's a very different look than just up the street um, where there are uh, duplexes. Right. Um, so and I think that's Alyssa's point is that it can be yeah. complementary without being the same. Yeah, that, I would agree with that. That uh, you know, yeah, Alyssa's as she said she, we're not asking them to design these commercial buildings to look like single family. Just like we didn't ask the um, the, uh, the um, light retail area to look like single family, we're asking it to have some semblance of a standard so that there's you know some tie-in together. I totally get that there's this 100-foot wildlife corridor and there's now the IC road, there's all these buffers, but you know, I think that what we don't want it to do is feel like it is a completely separate offshoot, you know, its own, you know, no, no holds barred development, you know what I mean? We're looking for it to be complementary to the rest of this overall development. And I think based on what you're proposing, you, you'll meet the requirement that you don't need the waiver. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a reasonable explanation because I think actually Don's point is is you know kind of the precedent there. You know, you've got two you got two styles of architecture that are very different, but they work mm -hmm. well together. Right. And it's a combination of different elements that make that work well together. Okay. Yeah, I think we're looking for some design standards for these buildings as well, and recognizing that it's industrial, you know, it's the IC, you know core of your site but we're also like like you know we don't want it that to be you know right now you're showing one two three four five six seven, eight buildings eight totally separate you know design buildings that just totally are there to meet whatever the core use is we're looking for some complementary reasonably relaxed but complementary standards for how you're going to develop this site as well is that a really good point, Mark? Um, does the board want to pursue a slightly less rigorous version of that design requirements um, document that the applicant prepared for the C1LR? Um, you know, maybe it doesn't yeah. have. Maybe it's not more relaxed in the sense that the standards are more relaxed, but maybe it just has fewer standards. Um, I, so. I think so. I think that to have the applicant propose something that they can live with that gives us some confidence, some comfort that we're going to get a complementary design, you know, that fits in with the overall development in the adjacent parcels. I, I hear you, and I think, you know, the anxiety is just that the uses in this area are yeah. very hard to make attractive. And I think, you know, <laughs> it, the, there's a very big sort of range of what it could be, right? It could be an outpatient building like Tilly Drive. Right. It could be, uh, it could be like Scott, you know, SD Ireland's, you know, newest concrete batching facility with like a big tube sticking up in the air and sand, you know, tunnels coming down. It could be a an asphalt plant. Okay, so, I get it. But also look at look at Meadowland Business Park, you know, which has sort of light commercial uses in there, and there is some design standards that, that have gone into each of those buildings. It's not just yeah. Early no, I, I, 
I don't think there's any challenge with that. I mean, I, I agree with what you guys are saying. Um, right. you know, I, I think the design guide piece, you know, would probably be challenging because it, it's such a, a vast sort of possible realm of things. But I think the yeah, approach yeah. of, you know, just needing to have them not be, you know, to have them have something. Yeah, you know, we're not like, looking for oh. the type of tight restrictions that we were discussing on the, you know, light retail area, you know. We're, we're looking for more, you know, tomorrow's coming, not more relaxed, but, you know, smaller, less cumbersome design standards, but still provide some standards that you can live with and that gives us some comfort that this parcel is going to be developed with some cohesive tie-in. You know, whether it's the site details, whether it's the site lighting, whether it's you know, something, you know, all the typical landscaping, and then maybe the buildings have more relaxed architectural to it, but that the site design is actually tying it together. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm just trying to envision something that gives you the freedom to go out and explore the tenant options, but gives us some confidence that it's gonna have a cohesive feel to it. Yeah. Can we live with this, Marla, an applicant? Um, so what other board member, I mean, it kind of took a left turn from what the staff comment was. So, you know, Mark had suggested some parameters. So the comment was originally, they asked for a waiver. Staff said, you don't need a waiver. You're already meeting it. Um, that was what Alyssa said. But we're now talking about providing some parameters part of the next application, the final plot application. For I mean, this is one of those things of like, when we see a proposed building, we'll know, we'll know whether or not it's compliant with 14.06B, you know, to paraphrase a famous phrase. Yeah. <laughs> so, Which is the uh, anxiety to not sleep at night. <laughs> right, exactly. So. We don't want to make your life easier, you know. But so it's one of those things, and I don't know if it's if the board's ever done this before. Has the board ever made a finding that recognizes the challenges implicit in a regulation, or do we not like to talk about our dirty laundry? And I get it if you don't want to, but I mean, all DRBs probably know that there are some sections of the bylaws which could be better written, but they're kind of stuck, or. They know it. They made all. They always make workarounds. No, our, our regulations are perfect and exact <laughs> and short. <laughs> Very short. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So I don't. So that would be something where maybe the board makes a finding about this section that says we understand these challenges. We will. We encourage the applicant to comply, and the you know. I, I don't know. I realize you don't want to tie a future board's hands, but at the same time, I think we want to be cognizant of the challenges caused by this regulation. Well, can we ask to chat and run with it? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't hear that, Marla. I can run with that in a draft finding. It can basically provide guiding principles to the future board when they're reviewing individual sites. Yeah. I, I think that that's that's what we're looking for. I mean, yeah. honestly, like you know, the we always hear, you know, you know, what's the board in eight years going to do? I mean, it could be eight years from now that we're coming in here with the, you know, the proposal for one of these lots, and you know, it also, you know, to the to the point that Paul was making earlier about clarity to the neighbors, you know, I want this permit to to spell out that, you know. You, you, to, that folks should understand that it is an industrial commercial area and that the development has intentionally given them a buffer and given them a road, but that they shouldn't be expecting, you know, that the homes will be architecturally, that they'll be architecturally similar buildings in their view shed, right? Because it is going to be in, in folks' view sheds. And I think a finding that says, hey, this was intentional, there's a buffer, there's a setback, these uses are a little bit incongruous. And while they need to have some design sense, you know, they are necessarily different. And, and you know, I think that that would be great. Yeah, because I think that, that, you know, it's just the exact, exact example of Meadowland Business Park in Knoll Circle. 
you know, looks down into Meadowland Business Park, but no one expects every building in Meadowland Business Park to be, you know, sympathetic or okay. relating to, you know, Noel Circle, which are all single family developments, you know, it's recognizing that there is the buffer and there is, you know, it's, it's there like commercial buildings. That something like that sounds great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're fine with it. It is 10 o'clock. And so it's fitting that we finally got into to number 50. Marla, is there anything um, at this point in time that we need to talk about before we, uh, we're not closing this hearing. We are, I guess we have to have public comment. Um, are there you any- You outlasted them all. Pardon? You outlasted them all. <laughs> Are there any members of the public who would like to offer any comments? Okay, everybody's gone to bed. So um, Marla, is, Marla, is there anything that you need from us before we conclude tonight's review? No, in all my free time, I'm gonna start on the decision so that when we come together on July 6th, we're almost done. We need a uh, motion for it. He said yeah. optimistically. I, I make a motion that we continue SD 2040 500 Old Farm Road to July 6th. So second. I hear a second. Okay, good. Second, second. from Dan. All in yeah. favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We'll see you on July 6th, guys. Well, thank, thank you guys you uh, very your much. Audience. This was, I feel like, a really productive meeting. We really appreciate it. Thanks for all Good. your time and efforts. All right, thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Okay, board. Yes? Yeah. I wanna ask a question. We have some minutes we need to approve. Remind me, Marla, can we do them in one batch or we have to do them separately? I believe you only have the April 20th yeah. minutes. Oh, okay, all right. Um, Would anyone like we to move don't May, We don't have May 4th. Um, Sue got them to me. I did not have enough time to get them to you. Okay. Okay. But they've been posted somewhere. Yes. Actually, okay. That's a good that's point. It. No, that's a good point. Did I not get the, oh. I will make sure. Sorry, I shouldn't have said anything on the public. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'm pretty sure they're posted. Um, it's the May 18th oh, really? quite posted. And I'm sorry, I should have put the May 4th in there. I don't know why I didn't. No, right. it was much more the public notice requirement, that's all. So are the no, you're right. Public posting. 72 hours. Draft minutes. Oh. All right. 72? April 20th meeting at minutes. Any, would anyone yeah, like to move, move approval of um, those? Uh, move approval, approval of the... Oh, yeah. I'll move approval of the April 20th minutes as drafted. All right. Second. I'll second. Good. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Okay. So we are we are done. We are done. And Marla, are you still okay. alive and with us? I know you're incredibly busy right now. So. Yeah, I will never um, suggest a special meeting a week after we have the hearing again. 